on behalf of the board, want to thank uh, UM Western for hosting our, our meeting, uh, for hosting the reception last night, and for the absolutely wonderful conversation with community members. Uh, Chancellor, thank you once again for that. Uh, absolutely, uh, outstanding meeting. And also, I'd like to recognize uh, former Regent uh, Krause is in the house. Uh, <laughs> former Regent Krause, could you stand up? Are you here? Hello, <laughs> welcome. Glad to have you here. Thank you for being with us today. Um, and so without further ado, we will now go to the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee, the ARSA Committee, Regent Sheehy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, going a little bit back and forth in my own documents here, so bear with me. Our first items are our consent items. Do you have a panel, the importance of parts and That's first. Let me see. Let me check my agenda again. Where is that thing from them? Found it. Okay, we're gonna start off with a panel with Linda Carell, Tobin Shearer, and Zach Stenberg speaking about the importance of arts and humanities in the Montana University system. Welcome. Do you have a leader? <laughs> and Regent Sheehy, uh, if I may, uh, uh, I'll uh, set this, the Moderate. stage for the panel. Thank uh, you. The uh, arts and humanities are foundational for critical thinking, decision making, comprehension of broader issues beyond immediate problems, and participation as a citizen in free society. I'm pleased to introduce our panel members. We have two faculty members and a recent graduate. Each are passionate about the role and importance of the arts and humanities. Each have a connection with the statewide nonprofit organization, Humanities Montana, which has been informally referred to as the extension service for the humanities in Montana. I'll provide a, a very brief introduction to each of the panelists in the order in which they're speaking. Mr. Zach Stenberg will speak first. He's a recent MSU graduate. He has an extraordinary story to tell about how literature has changed his life. Zach submitted a grant to Humanities Montana, Shakespeare Behind Bars, which was funded. Zach will be followed by Dr. Tobin Miller Shearer, who is an associate professor of history and the director of African American Studies program at the University of Montana. He is the current vice chair of Humanities Montana, and he will be followed by Dr. Linda Corral, who is a professor of Western American literature at Montana State University, and she is the immediate past chair of Humanities Montana. So we'll begin with uh, uh, Zach Stenberg. Is that on? Oh. Good morning. Uh, at the age of 22, I was in prison for the second time uh, with a 40-year sentence. I was told that I was doing life on the installment plan by the Department of Corrections, and I didn't have a very good attitude myself. I assumed the role of robber and resolved to play in cops and robbers for the duration of my life. Rather than simply lifting weights and gambling and watching wrestling on TV, for some reason, something inside of me inspired me to read. I'd heard that knowledge is power. I didn't buy the cliche up until then, and I only knew violence is power or control. I picked up Graps of Wrath at the Highside Library because I didn't finish it in high school and I didn't finish high school either. I read every other Steinbeck that the library had and continued pursuing the small little section titled Classics. After a couple years of incarceration, I tackled War and Peace and felt emotion for the first time in a very, very long time. Thus was the birth of me converting to a hopeless romantic in the dream of finding a Natasha someday. But I also felt empathy and emotion and accepted myself to feel those emotions. I made the choices that landed me in prison and growing up in institutions since the age of 14, I knew only too well where they would lead me. But I didn't care because I didn't really care if I lived or die. Revenge was also fueling my will to live for the first couple of years of my incarceration. 
Two men that I thought were my friends betrayed me and made statements against me to authorities. I didn't know how or when, but I knew that someday I wanted to get even. After reading The Count of Monte Cristo and Hamlet, I had a life-changing epiphany that no matter how just one may be in the pursuit of vengeance, it goes too far and can only lead to more insanity than any sort of resolution. I then made the conscious choice to let my desire for vengeance to go, and on my 25th birthday, for the first time in my memory, I was thankful to be alive, even though I was incarcerated. The last three years of my nine and a half years of incarceration, I was on work release. I took as many breaks as I could, and I read. Even though I was physically locked up, I escaped prison every day and had traveled the world and through time several times. A gentleman striked up a conversation with me, and Jim told me that he was a high school humanities teacher in Florida. Jim would go on to send me 103 books in the next three years and planted the seed for me to go to college upon my release. I didn't think it would be possible, but I did a dangerous thing for someone who had been deemed institutionalized. I began to dream that I would go to college. I was granted a parole and released from prison in May of 2011. I promised myself that I would play by the rules and give life a shot. Besides, I was going to college in five days at Montana Tech. However, I would go back to prison. Last spring, Dr. Gretchen Minton and myself, for my honors thesis at MSU, did a Shakespeare Behind Bars class at the Montana State Prison with a grant from Humanities Montana and a scholarship from MSU. It was hard for me to go back, but the rewards of teaching at the prison have been more than worth dealing with correctional officers again and seeing how classical literature is enriching lives now. Next Friday, I will have finished a third class at the prison and have plans for another one to start in May on rhetoric. While a visit at MSU, E.O. Wilson sent, said something to the effect that humanities nourish our souls. Literature doesn't simply nourish my soul, but it makes me want to be a better man. In my opinion, we, opinion, we simply read great books to become better people, and I know firsthand the power for change that literature, literature possesses. It becomes daunting and downright terrifying to think where I would be in life had I not gravitated toward the prison's library and specifically the classic six section. I'd probably still be a thug or in prison or even dead. Thanks. Thanks, Zach. That was really powerful. And thank you for having us uh, spend time with you this morning. To prepare my comments, I asked a dozen students to reflect on what they have gained from the humanities. Most responded as I thought they would. They pointed to critical thinking skills, writing prowess, essential knowledge. Reagan Collier, a journalism student, noted that humanities courses gave her the tools to draw deeper, more complex connections within and between subjects. Johnny Barber, a history graduate student, added that humanities courses have taught me the origins of the problems and conflicts arising in our culture, an insight that guides me in my decisions to personally contribute to a better future. That much I expected. When I teach a class on voodoo and Islam, lead students into an exploration of the political implications of the hip hop movement, or facilitate informed discussion of urban unrest in Ferguson and Baltimore, these are exactly the skills I seek to instill. Whether in history, English literature, philosophy, liberal studies, modern and classical languages, or any of the related disciplines, my humanities colleagues and I invest our best energy into forming students who know how to articulate probing questions, structure convincing evidence-based arguments, ponder enduring questions, act as informed world citizens, and write and speak with eloquence and insight. But I also received another set of responses that I did not expect. Guy Hansen is a friend of mine, a local business owner in Missoula, Missoula, and a member of the National Board of Directors at Farmers Insurance. 
In a recent conversation, he pointed out a new trend in business hiring. Employers are looking for workers with strong empathy skills. Articles in Forbes magazine back up Guy's assertion. Businesses have recognized that smarts and technical training can only get them so far. As Forbes reporter Jason Boyers asserts, the ability to connect with and relate to others, empathy in its purest form, is the force that moves businesses forward. I then noticed with great interest when several students informed me that the study of the humanities had made them more empathic. First year's honor student Ronan Kennedy wrote that the humanities gave him insight into the concepts of empathy and sympathy. Tony Aiello, a political science student with eyes on law school, said that taking humanities classes helped him learn to see from others' points of view by giving him the patience to listen, read, and process new information before speaking. <coughs> History and African American Studies student Morgan Curtin stated simply that the humanities taught her to be a better and more understanding human being. These are not just human values that we impart to our humanities students. They are marketable skills. Not only are businesses clamoring for the skill sets that our humanities students possess, but our country is in need of empathic citizens who can engage in civilized, informed, and nuanced debate about the big questions that matter to us all. I was perhaps most enthused by a response I received from a student who last semester took my course called Black, From Africa to Hip Hop. A media arts film major hailing from Helena, Montana, his name is Brian Rapoport, and I'll simply close with what Brian wrote. In my humanities classes, I have received cogent pedagogy that has shifted my perspective on the world. It has broadened my vocabulary. I have encountered, I have encountered oratorical elegance and philosophical profundity that has inspired me and other students to reach for greater heights and provided us with a multitude of new lenses to look through. What I've gained from taking courses in the humanities has left me with the feeling that I have actually received a real higher education. I will be graduating spring 2016, and I truly could not feel more equipped with the essential knowledge needed to make the world a better place. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Linda Carell, and I'm from Livingston, Montana, where I was born, raised, and educated through high school. I received my bachelor's degree from Montana State University, where I now research and teach in the English department from which I graduated. I can't claim to be a native Montanan. My ancestors are not indigenous to this place. Instead, they came from England, Sweden, Germany, and Romania. And they came to the United States, and then to the West, and then to Montana, three, four, or five generations ago to farm, to ranch, to find more opportunities than existed for them in the countries they left. They had limited educations, fourth grade for my grandfathers, eighth for one grandmother, high school for the other. I am a first generation college student. And yet, growing up, my house was filled with books. And my mother drove me to Billings to see my first ballet when I was 10. There was, in other words, a deep longing on the part of my family to introduce me to the arts and humanities, even when they seemed to have little, perhaps almost nothing, to do with the labor-intensive and working-class realities of my life. As critically, there was also a social and cultural valuing of the arts and humanities that made them implicitly important in my family's view. And it was the arts and humanities that saved my life in all of the ways that came to matter about how a life can be saved. Livingston is struggling right now as is Montana as a state, with an extraordinarily high and frightening suicide rate. And one of the young high school students who killed himself recently 
was a member of my family. I don't know what his reasons were, what secrets he kept, but I know that the place where I grew up was made wider, more expansive, became a launching pad into my full and complicated and extraordinarily rich life because the humanities, literature, music, history, films, Shakespeare in the parks, were something I reached out toward, were there in response to my reach. They gave me a language to think in, a way to reflect, a mechanism for asking questions about my world when to do so was both frightening and necessary. What I want to say is this, the arts and humanities are not luxuries. If we are to continue to move toward lives worth living in the largest sense, the arts and humanities are what help us understand what those lives entail, what they look like, what pleasures and responsibilities and obligations to others those lives incur. Specifically, the arts and humanities are not luxuries from the mistaken perception that only what is mathematically quantifiable or objectively measurable is either valuable or, frankly, employable. To write is to make an argument, whether it is a political speech or a novel or an employee performance review in a tech company. To write well requires thinking clearly, and it is hard to do. And it is as necessary for that tech company, for that medical staff, for that small business owner negotiating with a vendor, as it is for the novelist. When employees hire humanities majors, and they do hire humanities majors. My university president, Dr. Waded Cruzado, <laughs> has three degrees in the humanities. They are saying, I can teach you how to accomplish the details of your job, but it is the arts and humanities that have taught you how to think, how to create, how to aspire, qualities without which any business or organization will eventually flounder and fail. But in the largest sense, the arts and humanities are necessities, not luxuries, because they remind us that we are not alone. alone not alone in our self-doubt, our despair, our hopes for ourselves, and our children, and our nation. Jim Leach, a 30-year Republican congressman and chair of the Endowment for the Humanities from 2009 to 2013 said that, quote, the arts and humanities are vastly more important in troubled times, end quote. Times are always troubled, to be sure. But I would suggest that times are getting more and more troubled as our civil discourse grows more rancorous and our debates more isolating. Isolation, whether physical or emotional, whether as an individual or a state or a nation, is deadening. And there is nothing in the human condition that literature hasn't addressed. No emotions that music does not explore. No conflicts about what it is to be human that the arts and humanities don't help us understand. With the arts and humanities, we are never alone. And we are very often together. All of recorded human creativity awaits us to keep us company, to see us through, to avail itself of our reach toward it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the panel discussion. That, uh, an odd time of day to have that discussion, but it really grounded us for the rest of our meeting. Thank you. Do we have any comments about the discussion we've had thus far? Chair Tess. I'm not sure if this is a comment or a question or something in between, but when I was preparing for this meeting last week, I happened to be having a conversation <clears throat> with an um, environmental scientist um, from Missoula, a good friend of mine, and he said, you know, we, we dig dirt, we analyze what's in that dirt, we see if there are environmental pollutants in the dirt, we clean it up. Um, it's very physical, he said, but every single time he has an opportunity 
to hire somebody for his company, he wants somebody from the liberal arts. He wants somebody who knows how to communicate. He wants somebody with his firm that knows how to interact appropriately with other individuals and with broader society. So um, thank you for this presentation. Um, it, it matters not just to those of us from, from the liberal arts, but I think for everybody. Uh, outstanding presentation, thank you. Regent Holman. You can call me Asa. <laughs> uh, I actually prefer it. Uh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank all three of you for uh, coming in and, and sharing your stories and your thoughts. I want to just say that I couldn't agree with you more about employability in um, the humanities and liberal arts. I would challenge anybody who thinks that the humanities don't make leaders um, to look at the student governance that we have across the state. Over there are a bunch of bright young students um, that are student leaders from all over the state, and a vast majority of them, although not all of them, are studying the humanities. Over there you have 12 students from the University of Montana and from all the other universities. And from the University of Montana, every one of those students, save maybe two, are humanities students. I myself studied the humanities, and three of the last four regents who were student regents studied the humanities. So I think that the humanities in terms of employability and teaching life skills are without a doubt and, and quite frankly, unquestionably, one of the best places you can get skills that are gonna help you succeed. So thank you and just support everything. President Engstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, I certainly can't speak any more eloquently than the three of you did. That was a powerful presentation. I just want to say thank you. We know that this is an important Montana discussion. It's an important national discussion. And so I'm so grateful to have folks like you who will um, articulate so clearly the value of the humanities, the liberal arts. And I'm, I'm energized by your uh, presentation and, and uh, together want to rededicate all of us to the to the study of the humanities. So thank you very much for being here. Any other comments? Regent Johnstone, Bill. <clears throat> thank you, Martha. Um, <clears throat> Martha and I are gonna change the, the way we talk in this the room. But, um, I, first of all, thank you, extraordinarily eloquent. Um, I, I am a graduate of Montana State University as, in humanities uh, after uh, trying chemical engineering. Um, and um, I've been able to get jobs. Um, uh, and keep them, a couple of them. Uh, but uh, this is one of the most important conversations I think we've had, because I think there is questions um, in the state and uh, within some within the system about whether there is a belief on the part of the regents and a commitment on the part of the regents uh, to uh, the humanities and to liberal arts education, and I there is there is a strong commitment to it, um, and the, one of the reasons for it is um, the strength and the eloquence and the passion with which uh, you've described the importance of it. So thank you very much. President Cruzado. Well, I, I too want to add my voice. What an incredible panel. What wonderful, powerful testimonies about your personal lives and how the humanities and literature in particular transforms lives. I, I can add my name to, to that as well. Um, for the regions, what I, what I would like to say is it's important for us to open those doors of access for every student in our universities. It rounds up the education of the future engineer, of the future scientist, of the nurse. It gives them tools to, to do their job, but also to gain meaning. And that's what the humanities do. They provide our lives with meaning. And in difficult times and in good times, that's what we are all searching for, ultimately. But it's not only about providing one course or three credits or nine in general education courses. It is vitally important for us to protect our programs, our majors, our graduate programs in the humanities. 
because there are people out there that we cannot do anything else. And when you, when you are wired like this, when you're born with this passion, you have to, it's, it's, it's not optional. It's an urgent need for you to continue down this path. So that's, that's why I believe in the power of the humanities, but also in the power of what our courses and our formal programs can do. Life has been very generous with me because it afforded me an, an incredible opportunity to leave straddled, to, to have this passion for the humanities, but to serve land-grant universities with strong foundations in engineering and in agriculture. And I credit the humanities and, and, and the books I have read with the opportunity to reach out and to understand those incredible minds that we have in STEM and in, in engineering. I have been tentative. I, I have been telling my, my colleagues and the people in my team know um, we conducted this colors test and I'm the duck, up duck out. I'm the only one blue in, in my team of greens, which means they're very highly uh, analytical. But then I hired as vice president for student success another person from comparative literature and Chris Kearns it's, it's amazing what he brings to the team when we analyze things. Now, to, to finalize this, it's a, it's a testament, but it's also a sign of our times. When I have been telling my team, I want to go back to the classroom, I want to teach. Even as president, I want to start teaching a class at Montana State. And I, and I have scratched my head at what will people say when they know that the president is going to be teaching a class on magical realism, for example, <laughs> right? In a land-grant university. But I think it's the best thing I can do, right? And it's the best thing when, when yesterday, Asa, when, when I met the student leaders uh, around the table and they were talking about their, they're from philosophy or from English, I want for them to say that with their heads up high, with the same sense of power and pride as when a student said, my major is in business or in engineering. It transforms lives. And these three testimonies this morning, I'm, I'm sure have not only enriched our meeting, we will get out of here and we will continue thinking about the three of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, President. Any other comments? We're going to let the panel go. Um, I want to thank you so much. And I also, if, if you're able to stay until our break, our chair, Paul Tuss, is very stingy with breaks, but he's promised us one at 10 today. And <laughs> I know that all of us would love to greet you personally if you're, if you're still here. So we'll be looking for you at 10 if you're able to stay. Thank you so much. The next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. These are the level two memorandum from the November submission. I think we all remember these, but let's take a quick look at them. Um, we have the Dawson Community College. There's one from Montana State University Bozeman, one from Billings, and one from the Great Falls College, Montana State University. Does anybody have any uh, reason to take these off the consent agenda? Those will remain on the consent agenda. We'll still vote on them later, right? Yeah, we'll vote on those at the action items later. Next item on the agenda, let's get back to that, is our action items. The first four items are honorary doctorates. Um, these all have a separate item in our agenda, but uh, we don't reveal the names of the people who are receiving honorary doctorates. So, Unless there's any objection, I'm going to treat these as a group and ask if anybody has any comments about the four authorizations to the various entities to have uh, the authority to issue the honorary doctorates. Would you like to speak to those presidents or um, just obtain the authorization? Madam Chair, I think we are both prepared to speak to the individuals Great. and would like to do so Great. Uh, in public. Um, so. All right. In including their identities, if that oh. is okay with all of you. We'd we like just, to hear. <laughs> there's been some confusion about our process here, but I think that's what we would like to do. In our Great. Then let's take them one by one and let's start with previously unknown item A. 
soon to be known. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, I am so pleased to bring forward to you uh, the nomination of two individuals for the degree honorary doctorate uh, at the University of Montana. And it's our intention to present these degrees to these individuals at May commencement upon your approval. Um, both of these nominations have been through the usual campus process, uh, including uh, original nomination at the college level, uh, uh, appropriate action by the appropriate dean, full approval by the faculty senate in executive session, and then the usual process of provost and presidential approval as well. And so um, I am pleased to uh, identify both of these people at this point. So the first one uh, is a remarkable individual, J.K. Simmons. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Montana uh, with an undergraduate degree in music and has pursued a career in acting. You may recognize J.K. Uh, as the winner of the 2015 Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for his role in the movie Whiplash, in which he played an obsessive high school band instructor, uh, so different than his real personality, it was a remarkable job of acting. Uh, he has a long list of movie and television credits to his name, including the hits Juno, Spider-Man, Law and Order, The Closer, and many others. He's a prominent television lead in the commercials for Farmers Insurance, so you may see him uh, in those commercials. Uh, dun, 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 dun. How are they in those commercials? <laughs> Could you do that again, President? <laughs> but when we start our uh, system band that we talked about the other day, uh, we might do that again. Uh, J.K. has brought tremendous visibility and distinction to the university, and he credits the university in large measure for his success. He and his siblings have established scholarships in the name of, in the name of their parents. J.K. returns to campus frequently, and he loves interacting with our students uh, on those occasions of presenting those scholarships. So again, upon your approval, I, well, I have already invited J.K. to be our commencement speaker uh, in May. And so uh, he will deliver just a remarkable address. And just on a personal note, I've come to know J.K. now over these last several years. What a remarkable individual. What a humble individual. My first interaction with J.K., we met in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and we agreed to meet at a coffee shop. And here this, this world famous actor comes walking down the sidewalk in his jeans and his sweatshirt. A Grizz sweatshirt, by the way, and we, we sat down uh, in, uh, and had coffee and just a remarkable individual. When he got one of his awards on a TV, there was a UM hat on, and you may recall his message when he received the Academy Award. His main message was, go home and call your mom and dad. And that was such a powerful message because he had just recently lost both of his parents in the, approximately the year before. So with your approval, uh, we will award J.K. Simmons with an honorary doctorate. Our second nominee is a man named Jack Ward Thomas. Uh, Jack uh, has had a distinguished career in forestry, culminating in his appointment by President Clinton as the chief of the National Forest Service. Upon retiring from the National Forest Service, Dr. Thomas came to the University of Montana to fill our Boone and Crockett Endowed Chair in Wildlife Conservation. In that position, he brought to our students and to his faculty colleagues the experience of a lifetime veteran of national policy and practice in the field of forestry. He stayed with us in that role for 10 years and then retired to Florence, Montana, where he lives today. Uh, Dr. Thomas was a prolific scholar, accumulating over 600 publications uh, throughout his career. He's widely decorated with numerous awards and recognitions, and he is a remarkable individual who has brought distinction to the university and to himself. His degrees are from institutions other than the University of Montana, including his PhD from the University of Massachusetts. And so he was nominated through the College of Forestry and Conservation. Uh, Provost Brown and uh, myself and uh, Dan Pletcher, another forestry colleague, had the opportunity last week to go to Florence and, and tell uh, Dr. Thomas about this uh, nomination. And again, what a remarkable individual with a, a profound history of shaping forestry policy in this country. So I'm very <laughs> pleased to nominate Jack Ward Thomas as well. Uh, those are our two nominations. Both of them will be presented at commencement in May. So thank you very much.
Thank you, President. Do any of the regents have questions or uh, about these two nominations? We'll move on then to President Cruzado's nominations. Absolutely. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair, uh, members of the of the board, to allow me an opportunity to share with you two extraordinary individuals who have been chosen by our faculty senate to receive the highest distinction that the Montana University system uh, confers upon individuals who have made outstanding contributions to society. I have two extraordinary candidates uh, who will be addressing our class, uh, our graduating class. Um, first, it is a profound, with a profound honor to nominate uh, Willard Will Weaver, whom you know very, very well. Many of you perhaps don't know that uh, in spite of his strong ties to Montana and to Montana State University in particular, actually we lured um, Will from Pennsylvania to Montana State University on a football uh, scholarship. And he played for the Bobcats uh, from 1960 to 1964. And immediately he gave signs of being a persistent and, and visionary leader as a student athlete, but then an entire life devoted to education. Upon graduating, Will began his education career as a high school teacher of business in three public school districts in Montana before starting his exemplary career in education leadership that changed the nature of career, vocational, and alternative education and joint apprenticeship for the state of Montana. Actually, many of the topics that we have been considering yesterday in regards to dual enrollment, to the importance of two-year education, Will was a pioneer in the state of Montana. He's a uh, respected leader in the administrative transition of the state's K-12 vocational technical centers to the Office of Higher Education. For years, we still called our COTs VOTEX, and then afterwards, we moved from COTs to the current nom nomenclature that we have today. During his 16 years of leading what now has, uh, is known as Great Falls College MSU, enrollments increased exponentially. Program and class offerings grew with expanded hours of operation and training was provided to more than 30 companies annually and to more than 1,500 people. One thing that was absolutely essential um, was that Will identified a need in Montana State University Bozeman for some two-year programs. And that was the origin of two-year programs being offered by Great Falls in our Bozeman campus. That situation persisted until 2010, when the board finally approved the birth of Gallatin College uh, at MSU. And I, I am so proud to say that in that project, we worked hand in hand with Will and with our colleagues from uh, Great Falls College, MSU. I could go on and on and talk about the incredible list of distinctions that Will and his wife, Nancy, have garnered over, over the years. If you have met him, you know exactly what I'm talking about, uh, about the incredible quality of individuals that we're talking. And that's why in recognition of that, in 2009, Great Falls College MSU uh, recognized the Weavers for their ongoing commitment to the college by renaming the Library of Weaver Library. Um, it is a privilege and an honor to recommend Will Weaver, one of the nicest, kindest, gentle leaders that you will ever um, recognize at Montana, in, in the Montana University system. The second candidate, it's also an incredible story. Jean B. Sweeney. We're recommending Jean for an honorary doctorate in science and engineering. Uh, Jean Sweeney is a native of Billings, Montana. And she graduated from Montana State University in 1976 with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. Let me put this in context for you. In 1970, when Jean was starting her studies at MSU, 350,000 women in the U.S. received a bachelor's degree. But only 337 women received a degree in any field of engineering. 
talk about being uh, a pioneer. Um, Gene accepted a position at 3M in 1977, just one year after graduated from MSU. And her passion and commitment to high quality work was observed immediately by her colleagues there as she completed her first job, manufacturing the reflective paint used to make traffic signs, an invention that is an integral part of the road safety standards we have today. 3M quickly recognized Jean's talents and work ethic and promoted her rapidly in the growing company. <coughs> Actually, she occupied several positions, and in 2008, she became one of the vice presidents of 3M, one of only seven vice presidents of 3M. In that position, Jean is responsible for um, over 90,000 employees and in the areas of safety, health, and sustainability. Um, about, about 15 years ago, under a new leadership, 3M made a, a, a decision of only recruiting graduates from 10, 15 universities. And Montana State University, at that moment, had been providing great graduates to 3M, and that uh, situation stopped. But it never was removed from Jean's um, head and heart that that situation needed to be corrected. So actually, four years ago, when new leadership was at 3M, uh, Jean invited uh, us and a group of people from the Alumni uh, Foundation, and we went to, to, to 3M, we met, with the few employees that we had still, and we met with the Human Resources Department. And thanks to Jean's passion about Montana State, we are, we are, they are now recruiting extraordinary Bobcat engineers back to 3M. That's the kind of individual that, that Jean is. She's always available for Montana State. You can imagine what a powerful role model she is. She makes herself available every February when we celebrate um, Engineers Month. He comes, she comes and talks with uh, engineer uh, female students. She attends our, our dinner, the dinner that we have for engineer, uh, w for women in engineering. And she is an incredible, uh, spectacular engineer, but also a, f a wonderful, powerful role model. So in addition to that, Jean has been very, very involved with our foundation. And actually, as I speak with you, she serves as chair of the board of the uh, Montana State University Alumni Foundation. It is truly an honor, honor and a pleasure for me to recommend Jean Sweeney. Thank you, President. Do any of the regents have any questions about authorizing MSU to award these honorary doctorates? We'll move those to the voting part. Our next item on the agenda, switching back and forth, is item E, the mission statement review. John, could you speak to that? Chair Sheehy, members of the board, absolutely. Great Falls College MSU presented their mission and vision statement last September to this board. <clears throat> Excuse me, following that presentation, the commissioner asked Dean Wolf uh, to work with her campus to add some language um, that really connects the alignment of the mission and vision statement with the comprehensive two year mission of Great Falls College MSU. And uh, Dean Wolf did that. Uh, it reads very, very well, and uh, it's here before you today. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Sec. Um, I, I think we've heard quite a bit about this and seen the statement, unless anybody has any questions for Dean Wolf. Does anyone have any questions for um, Deputy Commissioner Sec? Any questions about this? Chair Tuss. Uh, thank you. I, I would just like to thank Dean Wolf um, for going back to the drawing board. Um, I think that the document in front of us, um, to be candid, is is better than what we saw before. And I know that um, it takes a lot of folks. Um, there you are. It takes a lot of folks to get this done. So please uh, tell your team back in Great Falls, uh, kudos for doing this. Thank you. 
Agreed. Any other comments? Seeing none, we'll move on to action item F. We're going to do something a little different here. In addition to the action item, we're going to move up the informational item involving the policy review. Um, since these are the, the action items implement the discussion that we're going to have in this information item. So uh, Elizabeth Turnus will speak about this. Chair Sheehy, members of the board, I'll, I'll provide a brief introduction while Elizabeth is working her way up to the podium. But beginning back uh, in the summer and in September, uh, Elizabeth and I uh, began having conversations with the two provosts and the chief academic officers of the system to to really uh, roll up our sleeves and take a look at the academic planning um, and proposal <laughs> process, approval process, and, and what, asking the question, what can we do to improve the process? Uh, the primary goal is to increase system-wide communication about new programs or centers or institutes or campus reorganizations. But we're also looking for ways and strategies to encourage campuses to collaborate with each other um, where and whenever possible uh, earlier in the process. And we uh, wanted to improve campus and public awareness of uh, the campus's three-year plans and as well as uh, implement a, uh, something new that's a little bit different that's an intent to plan process. Um, and then uh, finally, you'll hear about some efficiencies about the level one approval process, which Elizabeth will talk with. So Elizabeth has done a magnificent job of, of really helping to pull all of this together, and I'll turn it over to her for her uh, PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Dr. Seg. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, thank you for allowing these policy revision requests to come before you. And as Chair Sheehy noted, what we'd like um, to do is present information item A to you at this time as it informs those policy requests. <clears throat> so this presentation will seem familiar to many of you. Um, I know most of you have heard it before, so please along the way stop me if you have any questions or concerns or comments to share. Um, as Dr. Sek noted, uh, the goals of this process revision are twofold. We want to be more responsive to the needs of the campuses, to the needs of the public and private sector. And we also want to increase communication throughout the system, among the CAOs, um, with OCHI, and with the board. So for us, this meant uh, that the first look at a, a new proposal doesn't come um, to the regents, to, the, to OCHI, the deputy commissioner, or to um, the system CAOs as a final product. Um, so, the, so this proposal has been under development for some time now, and it really stemmed from discussions at all levels, uh, from between the, the presidents and the commissioner to the deputy commissioner and the, the provosts and across the system CAOs. So to begin, I would like to refresh your memory of uh, the two types of items that come before you as academic proposals, and those are level one items and level two items. Under level one items, um, you have two types of approvals, campus approvals and OCHI approvals. And under level two items, uh, those are items that are, are approved by the board. The board does vote on those items. I'll point out just a couple of things and a few changes within these two classifications. Under level one items, campus approvals, you'll notice bullet three, distance or online delivery of an existing degree or certificate program is bolded. That's because this previously was an OCHI approval, and we're proposing that this now move to a campus approval. Um, additionally, under OCHI approvals, you'll see bullet number two, terminating an existing major, minor, option, or certificate. This has always been an OCHI approval. The board has not voted on these in the past. However, it was a two-step process. There was an intent to terminate process. Um, and the, that process was not working uh, as, as it was intended to. And so we're proposing um, through the guidance of the campuses that that become a, a one-step process. I'll also point out under level one items, the very last bullet, temporary certificate or AAS degree program. <laughs> This is a, a special type of approval because uh, it has to meet two criteria. The first, it has to be offered in partnership or um, at the request of the public or private sector, and it has to fall outside of the normal approval process schedule. And these degrees would be approved by the commissioner for two years. 
during that two-year time, if the degree was to be offered beyond two years, it would need to come back for full board approval. And this is important to remember as we uh, get further into the discussion of, of new program proposals. Level two items, there is a, a bolded change up there, and that's establishing a new post-secondary educational program. And, and the change is simply in the wording. New post-secondary educational program is defined in board policy 303.1. One, and it includes degrees, certificates, options, majors, or minor where a major does not exist. Uh, the language changes simply for consistency's sake. So now we'll move on to talking specifically about level one proposals and what we're proposing to do to increase the, the responsiveness of, of OCHI and the board to campus proposals. So currently all level one items um, are submitted in conjunction with a regular meeting of the board, March, May, September, or November. And that can be quite restrictive uh, for the campuses. So what we're proposing to do is open this up to a rolling approval process where level one items are accepted by OCHI on a monthly basis and they're processed and approved or not on that monthly basis. The board would then be notified at the next meeting of the board of any approvals that have happened uh, during that time. The, the intent to plan, we haven't talked about that yet, but what's important to note here is that it would follow that same schedule uh, of the monthly rolling approval. So now moving to one specific type of level two proposal, the new post-secondary <coughs> educational program center or institute, and I'll probably refer to these just as programs for the, the sake of ease. We're proposing a, a three, three phases to these, uh, these program proposals. The first is the academic program planning. And this is a current process uh, that exists. It's in board policy 303.10. And this requires campuses to submit uh, their potential programs that may arise in the next three years. The changes that we're proposing under this, um, the proposed revisions, are to really structureize that. We've added some hard dates, requested a bit more information in the form of a one paragraph description of the proposal. and um, enhance the review process. These would require, um, as they are now, a similar process to take place um, on the campuses, moving up through the flagships. Obviously, a community college would not, would not follow that same process. It would come directly from the community college president or provost. These would be reviewed by the deputy commissioner and the system CAOs. They'd be reviewed by the commissioner and the presidents. Uh, and, and once all of those groups have reviewed these and there are no concerns, they'll be posted to a public website, as they are now, uh, for everyone to review and, and refer back to. You'll notice there's a footnote um, referring to extenuating circumstances. And this, we're, we're trying to be flexible. We don't want this to be rigid, and we know that one time a year uh, may seem that way, but it is important to note that under extenuating circumstances, as things arise, we can be flexible with that. Moving to phase two, the intent to plan. This is a new phase we would like to propose. This would occur um, at the very beginning of a proposal development, at the very infancy of a program. Uh, the intent to plan document would be a new document. You can see here, very, very brief, a few sort of general questions, knowing that planning has not really taken place and things have not been defined yet. This would follow a similar um, process or ladder as the uh, academic program plans. They would come through the flagship presidents uh, with the prior approval of the campus CAO or CEO and the flagship provost. They would come to uh, the deputy commissioner who would review them, share them with the system CAOs for comments. Uh, if, the, uh, if comments arised during that process, the deputy commissioner, much like he does now, would become involved to help work out any issues. Um, if no major issues surface, uh, the campus will essentially continue with the development process. Uh, the uh, intent to plans will be posted to a public website, again, where they'll be left for all to view, and they'll be shared with the board at the next meeting of the board. Um, now this may seem, adding an additional step may seem contrary to what we want to do to be responsive, as it could seem to slow down the process. But there are two things at play here that we feel uh, will alleviate that. The first is that the intent to plan occurs at the very beginning of a proposal development process. We know uh, new programs are not developed overnight. And the hope is that these won't come 
uh, to the board at the same time that they need approval or the campus needs to act on, the, on approving the item. Um, the other is that uh, we have removed a step in this final phase that we feel will actually help speed up the process. Um, so moving on to phase three, board approval. This is almost identical to as it is now with one exception. So the full level two proposals are received by uh, the deputy commissioner. They're reviewed. They're shared um, with the system CAOs for review and comment. With no major concerns arising, the, the proposals will move on to the ARSA committee call. If, if major concerns arise, the deputy commissioner becomes involved and tries to work those out. Um, at, the, at the ARSA call, if it's agreed upon that these shall move forward, they'll, they'll appear on the board action agenda at the next regular meeting of the board. And here's where the change is. Currently, at that point, the item would move to an information item on the board agenda, which would then allowed the board to deliberate on that item for the first time. Because we now have the intent to plan phase where the board has already seen that item, we feel it's um, possible to eliminate that, that later step. So the board would vote in one meeting on a level two proposal. So that leads us back to the policy requests that are before you. But before we get into those, I would like to ask um, or, or stand for any questions. Regents, do you have any questions? We'll start with the committee members, Paul, Casey, and Asa. Asa, go ahead. One of the concerns that we discussed um, both on the ARSA call and just in general as we've been discussing this is the ability to still be as responsive as possible um, and extremely flexible. And I believe we discussed um, that there's still the process for when there's a great need demonstrated to expedite this process through the commissioner. Is that correct? And can we speak to that just a little bit? Madam Chair, uh, Regent Holman, so I, I guess a couple thoughts. Um, one, if, if you roll back the, the clock about 18 months, this whole conversation started about how can we be more responsive as a system. I mean, I, I think we want to we want a process that works for us right now. We're creating delays between first reading, second reading that really serve very little value, where that work could be done ahead of time. Um, the intent to plan, I think, gets things out on the table early. So if there's issues, instead of working them out between the CAO call and <laughs> the five days before the agenda goes live, which has been sort of a nightmare, to be honest, um, we'll, we'll have some time to do that. And we can provide feedback uh, as a system, as a board, in good conversation. So I, I think overall, uh, change brings sort of that nervousness, but this is all about being more responsive, not less. And my commitment to this board is that is the driver of this conversation. And, you know, it's a new process. If we don't have it quite right, we will change this process as we go. But it, it absolutely is about being responsive, um, more responsive to the needs of Montana. It's about being flexible all those things I think we can accomplish within this. And, and I think we do so because we have the conversation early about where we're headed instead of late. And then we feel kind of pinned in, both from my office as a board, um, you know, people have worked on this a long time, how, how do we have input? I think it fixes that and, and uh, it, it, I really do believe um, that it will help the process. And if it's not, um, I, I want the campuses, I want faculty, everyone to know that we'll continue to try to make this right. Um, it, it is a new policy. We've worked on it a long time. I think uh, Elizabeth and John with uh, the provosts around the system have done a great job um, bringing this forward. <coughs> I think we've got it right. If we don't, we'll get it right. But responsiveness and flexibility are the, the heart and soul of why we're making the changes. Thank you, Commissioner. I think Asa has a follow-up. Just a brief follow-up. I, I agree with you, and I think that the process in this new format will be uh, more expedient and keep us from getting to the end of things before we've really discussed them on the front end. Um, but to that end, or to the just kind of speaking to the discussion part of it, um, can you just talk a little bit about the discussion that was shared, or how this was shared with, and feedback that was garnered from CAOs as well as faculty members? Madam Chair, Regent Holman, I can, but I, I think John has been doing this day in and day out, and, and like to defer. John, go ahead. 
Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Regent Holman, um, we've had a lot of discussion about this process, and, and the conversation has been going on a long time. In fact, it, it, it was going on uh, before this summer, and there were some various iterations that have been discussed that, that weren't necessarily moving forward. So we, we started from scratch um, in June. Um, I convened a retreat with uh, uh, Provost Brown and Provost Potvin um, to just kind of roll up our sleeves and talk about this process. And we started there, and, uh, and then we had a, a, a great discussion with uh, all of the chief academic officers at the September meeting in, in Butte. Um, and uh, we've continued the discussion. We continued it in November. Um, and uh, we asked the chief academic officers to, uh, to uh, work across their campuses to get feedback. And so it's, it's definitely been a, a process that, that has been evolving and, and, and it, we've been tweaking it uh, as we've received feedback. Casey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Deputy Commissioner Sack and Elizabeth, thank you for your work on this. Um, I know you've put a lot of work into this over the last uh, couple years. Um, what's not on uh, on the flow chart is what happens before it comes to, into this process. So that's um, the ideas being generated at the, the campus level, then going to the, the boards at the campus, and then it makes it through this labyrinth and then it goes to the, the Northwest Commission and, um, and beyond. And um, if there's anything that we can control as regents to sort of shorten that, um, I think it's a good thing, as long as the campuses are, are comfortable with the process. Um, just going back to uh, Dr. Lacey's presentation yesterday, we had a whole long list of things he's done in seven months. Um, and how quickly he's responded to the private sector. And uh, Regent Johnstone's um, comment yesterday that the private sector is not gonna wait. And so that's the, I think that's something that we need to be thinking about from a regent perspective on this process, that we've got to figure out a way to tighten this up and shorten this up. And I believe that's um, what, what you've done, John, and I really commend you for that. Thank, thank you, Casey. I'll weigh in as part of the committee as well. Um, I really like what they've done with this policy. I think this, these are all good ideas. The one problem I have with this is the reduction in the number of looks at board level from one to two. Um, I worry as a regent that we're not doing enough, that I'm not doing enough, with respect to looking at programs that are coming into our system, see if we're balancing the entire system. But we haven't really used the two-step process. I, I don't think that it has been a useful process the way that we've employed it as regents. So while I say I would like to have two looks at this, I don't think that slowing it down in the way that we have been doing that is particularly helpful. So I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this proposal. I, I want to put you on notice that I'm a little worried about the board um, one step in front of the board, and I caution the board members that in discussions that I've had with John about this prior to the meeting, um, this puts us, that puts the onus on each regent to look at the website and see what's coming up at the beginning of the process. This doesn't deprive us of the opportunity to do this, it simply takes away one reminder, the informational item that we used to get. So we can still do the job that I think we should be doing, but it's on us to really pay attention to that website that's going to say, hey, this university system is planning this and they're planning that, and it's all going to be there for us to review, it's just not gonna be reminded. Um, anybody else? Oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Madam Chair, um, if, if I could just touch on that a little bit. so. And we've talked about this a lot. That, that's a valid concern. And, and I think you point out, well, although we haven't really used the second reading in a meaningful way, but it is our, our thought um, and our intent that as we do the intent to plan, those will come to you as a board as information items then. So we will have an information item and a vote. They should be separated by a sufficient amount of time that then the feedback you present at the, the intent to plan step, at that initial information item, can be incorporated into the planning process. 
And, and so I'm hopeful that it, it will move us in the right direction, one that I think the board ultimately can support much earlier in the process mm -hmm. um, without you know, dampering any of, of what needs to happen at the campus. Obviously, these are campus proposals that need to come forward, but the board needs input in them. Uh, the board needs to be able to make resource decisions or at least let the campuses know what is likely their resource decisions um, early on in the process so we're not doing it later. So it, it is our intent to still have two looks at this, one with the intent to plan as an information item. We even debated, you know, should that be some sort of a affirmative vote? I think the problem with that is then we're sort of saying, well, here it is, we support this before you know more than that one page sheet of paper. And I think right. we probably don't want to go there, but um, we, we will bring them in as information items so we get early feedback and then ultimately, you're right, we'll have one vote on this. We'll need to make sure uh, it's what we want and that we get it right. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Chi. There. Um, one of the interesting parts about becoming a region is learning the committee structure and some things like that. And I've been a little surprised that our, com our committees meet just barely days before our regents' meetings. And I'm wondering if there's some value in looking at a way that we can have this information in a committee structure sooner so that as you raise issues, it isn't just three days, four days before we actually convene for our next meeting. Is there some value in the regents having a discussion about, about how we might get better communications earlier in the process prior to five days before uh, this meeting comes together each each uh, every other month. Bob, I've had that discussion with John as well, and we've tried to speed up our process with this committee, but it is difficult. And John, maybe you can speak to the, the hindrances to us meeting sooner than the Board of Regents. Chair Sheehy, members of the board, um, our current program approval process has set timelines for when the campuses submit their level two documents to our office, which is allows a, a fairly short amount of time for us to, to get that information out to the campuses for the CAOs to review them, for us to have a CAO call and resolve those issues and then convene a ARSA call. Uh, so I think that's been a, a major constraint there that um, we basically have, uh, uh, scheduled the, the ARSA call as quickly as we could to complete all of that. So um, this proposed process does allow for a little bit more time for the submittal of the information to our office. Thanks, John. Perhaps a follow-up, follow up, please. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Sec. Uh, but, but I guess what I, what I worry about is that if we only have a limited amount of time before we officially meet as the Board of Regents, that what ends up happening is that we end up rubber stamping it. And by the way, I'm in favor of this proposal. But, I, I, but again, I, I, if we're going from two, <coughs> two looks to one, could you provide us a little bit more lead time so that if there was good commentary coming from, from your committee, uh, Chair Sheehy, for the campuses to react and so forth so that it's it's well vetted and it's well defined prior to uh, coming in uh, for a full regents meeting. First of all, I, th I think we w I'm understanding this now that we will get that first look on the intent to plan notification. Commissioner? Madam Chair, uh, Regent Nystuen, so the answer is yes. We, we ultimately have to give you all as board members whatever time you need to accurately, thoroughly do what job? I, I think those are discussions we can have. The, the truth of the matter is, is these calendars just back up from the board meeting. So it, it's five days with the, the call, and before that, there's deadlines when the campuses have to have stuff to Ochi so we can prepare them for items. And, you know, it, it, I'm not overly proud of the fact it's a fairly lengthy process, but it's a fairly lengthy process, and it all backs up. So. If we create more time between the call and the board meeting, which if, if we as a group feel like that's insufficient, we can do that, but you know, I gotta be open. It will also back up the rest of the calendar for campuses and when those, right. those deadlines are. And, and that has sort of a, 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 
Well, it has the, the ripple effect of, of slowing the entire process some. But, you know, bottom line is, yes, whatever time we need to make sure that you all are comfortable um, doing the job entrusted to you, that's, that's exactly what we'll do. And, and we can work with John and the other CAOs to make sure that, that we feel like we're meeting that obligation. Thank you. Bill? Thank you, Martha. Chair sure, Martha. Um, <laughs> I, I had a, a, maybe a couple of questions and, and maybe a couple of observations, I guess. One, it, it was a little confusing to me whether the intent to plan comes before the program proposal. I, it looked like the order was the intent to plan was in the middle, and I thought the intent to plan would be the first step in the process. So could you clarify that for me? Chair Sheehy, Regent Johnstone, um, in the, let's, let's begin with uh, just taking a look at the current system. So the current, the current system does request that each of the campus CAOs work through the flagship institutions and the community colleges separately, um, submit to our office once a year the, the, the programs that the campuses are thinking about for the next year and then two years after that. But they, they basically just submit a, a name of the program. So now with this process, we're asking them to put a little more thought into it and submit a name and a paragraph description so that we know a bit more about it, what they're looking at for the next academic year and then two years after that. So it's basically following the same process. The intent to plan then is um, when a campus or their faculty say, okay, we're, we're ready to start planning for program A, and, and, the, and the campus may have five programs on the list, but they're only ready to start planning for one. Then they would go through the process of completing the form. Understood. So my uh, two observations, I guess. One, where do existing programs, they don't fit into this. Well, what are we doing relative to the oversight responsibility we have uh, concerning existing programs so that we're going through the, somebody's going through the process of looking at those? I mean, clearly, and it's evidenced by the experience we're having in the system right now, curriculum and program are, are maybe the, one of the most important things that we do in terms of oversight. Um, and if we get it right, things work well, and if we don't, we have issues. So, and uh, I'm interested in that. Um, and then secondly, I guess, an observation, I've been on the board, I don't know, two years, I guess, uh, but it, a general observation is that I think we spend too much time on minutia and not enough time on important strategy. So if this will drive us to what I think is our more important role, uh, I'm all for it, uh, but I think that from my standpoint, that's how I will evaluate this, not so much today up front, but how it works. Is it really influencing uh, the ability of the board to, to look at the important strategic program curriculum issues? And you know, a lot of what comes before us, I would be entirely comfortable delegating the responsibility for approving and oversight that to the, to the, to the units or to the commissioner's office. What I'm very much interested in is making sure that the things we ought to be looking at, we ought to be providing oversight, get to us, get to us on a timely basis with enough information. And my last observation, I guess, would be, I hope this process will result in information coming to us upon which we can make a decision. And there are good analogies to the private sector and there are bad analogies to the private sector. But, um, I would never bring to my board of directors a 150-page document to approve a new business or something else. I'd bring a much more concise document that identifies the important policy issues that the board needs to decide. And again, I hope this process will result in an improvement of that. I, I don't need the same thing that President Cruzado does or, or President Ingstrom in their review process. What I need is the key issues and the key information to make the decisions that I should be making uh, as a board member. Thank you, Bill. John, go ahead. Chair Sheehy, Regent Johnstone, I just wanted to add to that. I think uh, on the agenda today in a few minutes, we'll hear from Dean Wolf, who will speak to the academic prioritization process, which she and her faculty followed at Great Falls College MSU. And I think that that starts to address some of the issues that you just raised a moment ago. Fran, did you have a comment? 
Um, so as we seek to um, uh, integrate this process, and I'm curious in looking at other um, programs throughout the country, if this has been successfully employed in this way, this kind of model. Chair Sheehy, uh, Regent Albrecht, uh, that's a very good question. We, we did look at other systems, and, um, and, and that was a challenging task because there are very few systems that look alike. Um, the structures of the systems are different. The scope and authority of uh, the state systems are different. And so we did find some that were similar to us, and we looked at them, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and some others. And, and we found, um, I, I, think, I think I can honestly say that what we have before you today is, is uh, uh, probably better than anything we saw out there. And um, uh, one of the states, I won't mention which one, but Elizabeth and I were, were uh, sort of shocked by the level of complexity um, uh, that was involved in their process. Are there any other questions? This is an information item, but it leads us back to our action items. Um, these are items, I think H, I, J, and K. John, it's my understanding, and Elizabeth, that these are, I've read these, I assume everyone else has read their agenda also. These simply implement the program you just described to us and that we've been discussing. Yes, Madam Chair, that's correct. Specifically, um, and it, it is items F through K, there are six Paul academic board Thank policies. You. And um, there are two that specifically would implement this process change. The other four, um, assuming that those two are changed, would then need to be changed for consistency's sake. Okay. Uh, so those are policy 303.1 and policy 303.4. Um, those, those are the two substantive changes. Yes. Now that we're on to the action items, is there anyone else? who has a question or a comment. President Engstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I just thought you might want a bit of a campus perspective on this proposed policy. Um, and I think it's a very important step forward and I wanna say thanks to John and Elizabeth and the academic officers for working their way through this uh, over the last several months. I think a key word here that this policy helps is collaboration because it gives the campuses the time to go from really a conceptual idea at the intent to plan stage to a proposal that really does reflect <coughs> what we all have to offer uh, into a particular proposal and so on. And the current process really is not that conducive to those kinds of collaborative conversations between campuses and so on. So I think this is a very important step forward. I'm glad to see uh, I'm glad to see us moving in this direction. I think it will actually serve you as regents better too because it gives you the opportunity really at the conceptual stage to say, yes, this looks like a, a good idea or we have questions or what have you. Whereas now, like you were saying, you see the full blown <laughs> proposal and are expected to act on it in a matter of days and that doesn't give you time to think about the concept or the collaborations and so on. And then I did want to just, uh, address uh, a comment about the Northwest Commission, uh, Regent Lozar, and somebody brought it up yesterday. I'm a commissioner on the Northwest Commission. So I just want to clarify procedurally for you that um, the Northwest Commission handles uh, most of these programmatic changes very, in a very pro forma way. It's a very, very uh, simple process. It's not even done at the meetings. It's done online and so on. The only time when it becomes a major issue for the Northwest Commission is if it appears that an institution is going beyond its stated mission. So if you had, for example, uh, a college that has a mission at the undergraduate level and you see a change come forward for, say, a PhD program or something like that, that triggers the Commission's attention and would probably cause a little bit of, you know, uh, conversation that has to take place. But for the most part, those things are done at the staff level and they're done very quickly. So it almost never holds up an individual campus. Thank you. Any other questions or comments regarding items F through K? 
Chair Tess. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that campus perspective. Th thank you, President Engstrom. I'm, I'm curious uh, from, from perhaps the other side of the divide if, if we could ask uh, Pre President Cruzado um, with regard to this. I'm sure that there's been a, a fairly robust conversation at MSU and the MSU campuses as well and, and, and your take on what we're about to do here. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And, and actually, I would like um, to make a brief, some, some brief comments and ask the Chair of Faculty Senate to, to share his view. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted on this one because um, what, I, what I have been hearing as we go around the state um, in, our, in our visits with um, communities, breakfast like the ones that we had this morning, for example, what I have heard from those communities is that they want, would like for us to be more responsive to the, the region, to the communities, to specific business sectors that are waiting for these proposals to be implemented. Um, and, and I think that what we're trying here to do is to balance two, two different uh, elements. One is, as, as John has said, is communication. The other one is efficiency. And, um, and I don't know. I, 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 I'm, I'm asking myself if there are other ways in which we can establish better communications and more trust, perhaps, among campuses and between campuses and the regions, or more interim meetings. Um, I was in a different um, uh, uh, system. I know that uh, Royce, Royce was in a different system, which now will reflect this better. I was in a very different system in which the regions had more committee members in, during the interim, and then when they came to the board meetings, it was just for action. And in that sense, they didn't take two days of meetings. They would take half a day of meetings, right? So I don't know. I think, I, I think that this is, I'm willing to try this. I'm always willing to try things. Um, but I don't know if, if there are other issues that we are trying to correct with a, with a structure. Um, and we have not talked about the issues. Um, for example, in, in, in New Mexico, there were seven different Board of Regents for seven different public institutions. The issues about unnecessary duplication were never at the forefront. Somehow, there was a natural tendency from campuses to avoid unnecessary duplication. And, and I think that perhaps we're, we're placing, that's, that's what's at the root of this conversation. Having said all that, I want to make sure that we come up with a process that's fair to the faculty, with a process that's fair to the business uh, and the industry who are waiting for us to make a decision and to implement this, uh, this program. So, Randy, would you, would you like to expand? Um, yes, but I'll probably speak as the chair of uh, MUSFAR, uh, because I think we're almost in agreement that as proposed, I think it's a plan that could work. Uh, I guess one concern is that there is enough time um, between the proposal submission and the issues and the, and the final column that the, if there are issues that it can be worked out that, and revisions made to the proposal so that it can be in that same timeline. The item four says if there's no issues, it goes to the next board meeting. But if there's some issues, I hope that it can be worked out and still go to the next board meeting so that efficiency would be there. Um, so, but otherwise, I think as proposed, uh, we're good with this. Thank you, Dr. Babbitt. Are there any other questions regarding action items F through K? I'm going to move those on to voting. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your presentation today and for all of your hard work on this. It's really been a pleasure watching you work, John, as always. Um, next item are information items. We've already been through item A. Let's move on to item B academic program prioritization update. Um, I'm going to ask Dean Wolf to speak about this item. Welcome, Dean Wolf. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That works better. <laughs> um, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today as the, as the Board of Regents, and I'm certainly speaking on behalf of my education colleagues around the state, no matter at what level they are. You heard yesterday 
the very real processes that many of the institutions have been and are going through in balancing resources and expenditures. And we are in difficult times right now, most of us with declining enrollment or, or um, even enrollment. So I just want you to know that I hope I can speak on behalf of the hard work and the excellent work that my colleagues um, across the state and certainly with the system office um, do. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Heidi Pasek, who is not with us today. She's our chief academic officer, and she's the one who came to me a little more than a year ago. Uh, we had gone through a process where um, our enrollment had declined two years ago uh, more steeply than what we had planned for, and our, the way we balanced the budget then was um, through attrition. So when people left, we didn't refill the position. It was very, very clear, very early, that was a reactive, not a strategic way to do business. So she came to me and said, I think a, a group of us needs to go to Bob Dickinson's training, um, the academic prioritization process. So I did send a group of five people to Arizona. We called them the Phoenix Five. And there was a faculty member, um, uh, you know, along with some of the administrators. I also want to describe what we have on our campus as a college planning budget analysis committee. And this is probably the most, the greatest example, I want to say, of shared governance that I've ever had the opportunity to work with. Students, faculty, administrators, staff all belong on that committee. All of our decision making, whether it's our budget, whether it's hires, go to that committee. It goes to faculty senate before it comes to the executive team for our deliberation. I think that really helped set the groundwork for the, the good work that um, happened through this process. We also do a three-year budget planning process. That was something I had brought from the state of Oregon where it doesn't help if you're only planning for the next year. Now, you can't have the detail in your year two and three because we don't know what our allocations are going to be. But at that, that puts us on notice if we want to plan for a new program or if we have a program that's going to go in moratorium or we have positions that are being funded through grants, we need to know when those positions and that funding is going to go away. And that's really helped us um, plan. And certainly uh, campuses who were blessed to have institutional researchers um, and good budget officers, those also um, make a big difference. I'm going to share with you a couple of quotes from Bob Dickinson that I think all of us can take heed from. Most institutions can no longer afford to be what they've become. I think if we all would take a hard look and go back and look at our course catalogs, we're going to find courses that haven't been taught in a long time, programs where enrollments are not strong, programs that no longer support what our world of work is today. The other quote, and that's the one we really held to and, and will hold to going into the future as we prepare our seven-year strategic plan, the most likely source for needed resources is the reallocation of your existing resources. So in other words, we knew we were not going to have new money, but we also knew that we had to have available resources to be able to respond to industry and our community needs. So we had to look at what we had been doing and, and make changes. I really appreciate the comments today um, from Regent Johnstone and others um, about the need, um, certainly, to respond to business and industry. You saw Great Falls College MSU do that three years ago when ADF International was looking to come into Great Falls. And moving at academic speed was not going to get us where we needed to go. And it was a frightening thing to go back to my campus and say, we will be moving at industry speed now and not academic speed. But I really appreciate that. So we announced um, in March of last year to our campus that we were going to go through this prioritization process. In May, I advised our community members. I have an executive advisory committee. So we gave our community notice um, almost a year ago what we were going to be doing so that there would be no surprises. Over the summer, we used our registrar, budget officer, research analyst, and human resources to gather data and, and establish the criteria. In August, we formed two task forces by nomination. We opened it up to the entire campus, academic and administrative, because every office, every service besides academic program was reviewed, including my own office. 
So we formed two task forces for those reviewing all of our academic programs. Only faculty members were involved. No administrators served on that task force. On the administrative one, it was our mid-managers and staff on down. Again, the executive team did not serve on that. We wanted this to really be a grassroots level. We wanted the hard work being done by the people who do it every day and to bring us their best work. So I'm just trying to, okay. So they did that work. They met every week fall semester. That's amazing when you think about the faculty and all the people involved. By the end of December, um, I was given all of the results of that hard work. In early January, before classes started, we held two information sessions where we put up on the screen how the program's academic and administrative areas we had been placed into five quintiles. Quintile one meaning that um, things were going well, quintile five um, and quintile four basically were the ones I was gonna focus on. But besides that work, um, which um, we looked at enrollment, retention, completion, graduation and transfer, but we also spent some time, and I, I might be taking a little bit long, but I apologize for that. But I wanted to also look at job placement rates and more importantly, I wanted to look at what the earning potential was. We feel so strongly at the college, and I know my colleagues feel the same way, that if a student comes to us for one or two years of work, learning, and they leave with a certificate and degree, and they go out on a job, and they don't make any more than somebody hired off the street, I've now put them in debt. That is morally wrong. That's all I can say. So we then, I also looked at the work from our Great Falls Development Authority. They had done um, several economic studies. The BBER from the University of Montana looked a lot at their reports, talked with them, um, looked at the governor's, um, all the reports that he's done, Main Street, Montana, also the Labor Day report, um, worked very closely with Pam Busey, the Department of Labor and Industries, looking at their job um, projections and also national reports. So prior to my announcing my decisions on campus, the decisions were only mine. I told my executive team, I told them um, where my thinking was, I asked for some more input, but I said the decisions rest solely with me. I didn't want anyone else to have to um, have that on their shoulders. Prior to announcing my decisions, I contacted area legislators, congressional delegate offices, the co governor's office, and I certainly kept President Cruzado and the commissioner and his staff um, appraised as or apprised as we went all through the process. So at the end of all that, um, we announced 10 areas that were closing, 10 academic programs and one uh, administrative area that we'll reorganize, we'll bring back, back in, a different, um, in a different fashion. Of that eight positions, full-time positions um, were impacted, six faculty, two professional, um, with a potential savings of 400,000. We had set a minimum of saving 250,000 um, re, you know, for reallocation. This will take us to the 400,000 level. But please know that it's not like tomorrow I'm gonna have $400,000 because we are required and we very definitely want to do this, the teach out for our students who are currently in those programs so that they can complete their programs. So for the next year and a half, the faculty will be with us unless they're fortunate to go out and find their next best job so they can continue their livelihoods. So at that, I stand for any questions. Thank you, Dean. Any questions, comments? Go ahead, Commissioner. Comment, I'd just like to say, Susan, thank you. Um, truly, this is impressive work. We, uh, this is something that the, the board, when I was uh, a member of the board, took up in, in earnest. We even had Dickinson up uh, and spoke to us. Um, it's important work, and we know that many of the resources we need, that's where they're going to have to come from. And I think that's becoming ever more clear uh, across the country. Um, and, and we've had a prioritization sort of requirement from the board for years, um, but speaking of perfunctory, that's, that's what they've been. They've been in my view, very shallow. They've not accomplished a lot. They kind of checked the box. Um, but this was real. It was a yeah. deep dive into what needs to happen on a campus to find those resources, to make sure we're serving the communities in the state of Montana. 
in the best light that we possibly can. And so I, I truly appreciate the work that you've done here. Um, as Steve Barrett would say, uh, if he was here, that, that was some heavy lifting. Yeah. <laughs> and you got it done, and uh, it, it's very impressive. So thank you thank for your you. leadership. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments? Bill? Thank you. Casey? I will third Bill. <laughs> um, just a quick question on your response to um, uh, from the students when the announcements were made. You know, it's uh, we are um, we're just amazed with this. Our advisors, um, due to good leadership um, in that area, they were prepared ahead of time and they met with the students. We put out talking points both to the campus and then, of course, to the press and the external community. And what they've done is they've, the students have come in and they, they said thank you because if I was headed to a job where I wasn't going to be able to pay off my student debt in a timely way, thank you for helping me make a different decision now. We have um, issued a full refund for a young woman from the state of Wyoming who was in one of our programs. It was a total online program. She wouldn't be able to finish in the next year and a half. Um, so that was the right thing for us to do was to issue a full refund. So students have um, really have done the, um, you know, taken this really, really well. The faculty, I'm so proud of them. Those people, the people who have been impacted, it was a difficult thing. Um, I went around and met with every one of them to have those conversations. But again, I think they understood we were doing it for the right reason, and the right reason is for our students. We'd had a campaign through our strategic enrollment management process last year, and we started out the fall by asking the question, what have you done today to help a student come back tomorrow? And then I would send out emails to the faculty and the staff and ask that question, and then they would answer you know, that back. And so that's been a real um, thing for us to do. And the other um, kind of tagline we had on with that is, it takes all of us. It takes the custodian. It takes the person answering every phone to make a difference for our student. And right now, I'm so excited. Leanne Frost is with us. She presented yesterday. She's being um, quite the leader. We're going to have learning communities for our gen ed students starting fall. It's going to be a modified block system. It's going to be eight weeks. So exciting um, for that. And she was talking to me last night about our Math Pathways project, which is going to help move our dev ed math students and, our, and all of our math students through more quickly. So we, we didn't stop. I mean, we made the hard you know, decisions announcements, and we're just moving forward. Thank you. Any other comments? Chair Tess. I just want to join the thank you chorus. Um, th th this is a lot of heavy lifting, as the commissioner talked about, but it's, I think, precisely what Montana residents expect from higher education when it comes to efficiency and effectiveness. So thank you. Yeah. I, I remind everybody on my campus that our taxpayers pay our salary, and our taxpayers expect this of us. So thank you. If there are no other questions, oh, Bob. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So, Mr. Commissioner, is this uh, kind of a best practice, a template that will be used elsewhere within the Montana University system? Madam Chair, Regent Sheehy, I certainly believe it is, and that is uh, part of uh, why we've asked Dr. Wolf to be here and, and share this success story. Um, I think it's absolutely something that that we need to broaden across the system. It, it, it is working for them, and, and there's other campuses that absolutely need a, a process, either this process or one very similar to it. Any other questions? Thank you, Dean Wolf. We'll move on to information item C, which we are moving to the May agenda because Ron Muffick is unable to be with us today. So we'll move to item D, level two memorandum. I assume that all of you have read these. Um, I don't plan to go through them one by one, but if we have comments on any of the level two memorandum that are presented here, please weigh in. Bob. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess uh, from my old days back at Flathead Valley Community College, I wouldn't mind get, just getting an update maybe from President Karras' perspective. What, what, what's this mean to Flathead Valley Community College so that I can answer some questions when we get home. Madam Chair and Regents, Regent Nice to be here. We have Thanks, Mark. 
Uh, we've worked closely with MSU Bozeman's College of Nursing. In fact, we invited them to come to the Flathead in about 2001, 2002, and it's been a very collaborative relationship. And we've continued to work well together, and we appreciate all of their support. We also, as you know, have nursing at all levels, and there's a need in the healthcare community for nurses prepared at the PN level, the practical nurse, the RN level, both the associate RN and the baccalaureate RN, as well as master's prepared nurses. We certainly want to continue to work with MSU, but as they continue to grow their program, we just would ask that they continue to work with us due to limited clinical opportunities as our nursing program grows and theirs grows, that we can work together to find ways to ensure that all students in that nursing pipeline have the opportunities to become nurses and better serve our, our state and our region. Any other questions or comments about any of the information? or the level two items. Chair Tess. Yeah, and maybe it's the same item uh, the Regent and I student had talked about. I, um, I'm curious about the difference um, be between a site that seems to be working well and the new designation as a standalone campus. And I'm, uh, I don't necessarily have the answer to that, but if somebody could answer that question, I think that um, it's probably a question that a lot of other folks have. I haven't heard a lot of folks um, talking to me about interest in having more campuses of the university system. So I, I don't know if it's vernacular we're talking about, and I don't understand the words, um, but if somebody could talk about that, I sure would appreciate it. John. Chair Sheehy, <clears throat> Regent Tuss, uh, that's a great question. And I visited with uh, Provost Potvin about that. And basically, as I understand it, the Kalispell site is a site of the MSU nursing campus at Missoula. And so what, uh, what MSU is, is uh, recommending is given that the, the growth of what's happening in Kalispell, their BSN program, Rather than have it be a site of the Missoula campus, they want it to be a an actual. Um, uh, they want it to be an actual nursing MSU nursing campus in Kalispell. Provost Brown, did I describe that properly? <laughs> yes. <laughs> But it, okay. it's, what's the substance? Yes, that's, that's if, I, if I may add, yes. that is exactly correct. Remember that we have, in our nursing program, in addition to the campus in Bozeman, we have a campus in Bellings, we have a campus in Great Falls, we have a campus in Missoula. And then we have, think about it like that site had been like a satellite of the Missoula campus, but it has now grown to such a level that they're ready to be just like Missoula and Gratefuls and Billings and Bozeman. So uh, can I have a follow up on that? Uh, what additional resources will be given to the students of that site now when we change the designation to a campus? What will change in a substantive on the ground way? I'm not versant on exactly what is it that the students will get. I think that it's just a matter of better coordination and administration for that, the faculty and the students of that site so that they have more, more of the support that they need. Bob, go ahead. Thank you. I, I guess kind of curious for, for Dr. Karras, is there any concern that this, this change would take the wind out of the sails of the great nursing program that is up uh, in, in Kalispell in Northwest Montana? Madam Chair, Regent Nystuen, you know, I don't know all the details of Bozeman's plan. I do know their, my, my understanding as President Cruzado said is it really does allow them to better coordinate internally their ability to work with their nursing program. Our one concern, though, is if they do expand their accelerated nursing program without working with us because our nursing program is growing. Um, certainly nursing uh, through the new uh, statewide grant, the federal grant that uh, the University of uh, the Missoula College is leading through the commissioner's office as we're all expanding nursing. I think one of the challenges and the discussion we all need to have is that there is a great need for nurses in this state. 
There's a need for nurses at the practical nurse level. There's a need for nurses at the two-year Associate of Science Nursing RN level. They take the same national licensing exam that the baccalaureate prepared nurses take. Um, depending on which side of the divide you're on, the research shows that the Associate of Science prepared nurses are actually better nurses and do better on the national licensing exam. But there's also a great argument for the baccalaureate prepared nurses who do get the additional uh, gen ed core classes to help them become, um, often hospitals are looking for that because of the Institution of Medicine and Robert Woods Johnson report that came out identifying hospitals to achieve or strive for magnet status, which requires 80% of their nurses to be baccalaureate prepared. So many hospitals are moving in that direction, but they're hiring associate prepared nurses and then giving them several years to do the baccalaureate completion, which several of your colleges and universities have right now in the state, which really helps everybody in the medical community, but certainly in rural communities across the state, finding prepared nurses is a challenge. And as more and more nurses start to retire, there already is a gap in the nursing employment, and I think one of the challenges, because clinical sites are required to have no more than 10 students, they're very limited in the opportunity as nursing programs are in the same area and competing for those clinical sites, we would just be concerned, I think, at Flathead Valley Community College as our nursing programs continue to grow and our last nursing class, again, had a 100% pass rate on the national licensing exam. That's pretty incredible. Um, nationwide, that's almost unheard of, and we've had that continually. So we would like to continue our high quality program. We work closely with Bozeman, but we also, at the same time, as they continue to grow their program, would hope that it doesn't prohibit, prohibit our nurses from having the opportunity to have those clinical opportunities in our community. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, last uh, September, October, I had the privilege of visiting virtually every campus except Miles City and Dawson. Um, and, and one of the things as I went on my visits to each campus, they said, Bob, come here, you, you, gotta, you gotta see our nursing program. And so uh, there was great pride in, in every campus about the, the program they have for nursing. And as Dr. Karras is describing the, these various levels of nursing, I'm going, holy, I, I don't understand this. And I, don't, I know I don't have to be an expert in it. But yesterday, the whammy program was so informative from the standpoint of, I get it now. I really understand that. Perhaps at some future board meeting, we could have a little bit of an update across the state. What are we doing in the healthcare world, especially relating to uh, nursing, the rad techs, the surge techs, all of that, because we are having an impact on the state. Um, some people perhaps could argue that maybe there's, it's too duplicative, that we've got all these sites, do we really need all these? Uh, you know, it's tough for me as a, as a banker to get my arms around the healthcare delivery world, let alone understand all these various levels of nursing degrees and, and things like that. So just as a point of, point of information, somewhere along the line, it'd be great to have a, a better update on on the medical delivery, things we're doing beyond just the whammy program and, and beyond. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. And just for your information, Commissioner Christian is already working on an overview to present to us of the medical fields, including nursing, with a breakdown in the nursing programs, the differing kinds available throughout the system. He's been working on it, and he, I, he's already informed me that that's going to be up and running here soon for us to know about. Madam Chair, um, as we talked yesterday, we we're hopeful we can bring something in May and, and explore that. I mean, it, encompassing all of healthcare in one meeting is gonna be a challenge, but we started with WAMI. We'll, we'll probably have a focus on nursing, um, but try to bring all of this together as quickly as we can for you. I hate to beat this horse to death, but about this nursing thing, I am, am I to understand, and I'm sorry I can't look at you directly and speak, but does Flathead Valley Community College offer non-baccalaureate nursing degrees, and the site that currently exists offers baccalaureate degrees, but not named Kalispell Campus, but named from some other campus, and we're only proposing now to change the name of that, but still offer baccalaureate degrees? Madam Chair, the Kalispell Campus does, and don't worry about having to turn your around, that's okay. I'm used to being at the back table, that's fine. <laughs> the um, 
we do offer nursing. We offer the CM, CNA certified nurse assistant. We offer the practical nurse degree. We offer the registered nurse. And you can become a registered nurse either through an associate of science degree in nursing or through a baccalaureate of science in nursing. They both take the same national licensing exam. So nurses can become RNs either through, and depending on what their, their career goal is or, or what they're able to do, many, many of our nurses are students who, or nursing students are students who, for whatever reason, had to take a break between their education for family or for work. They've worked in the hospital. They've decided they wanted to be an RN. They've always had a dream of being a nurse. Um, they're able to, and because nursing programs are, are very small, again, because of the clinical sites, they have very large waiting lists. They're very difficult to get into. So the more nursing programs we can offer in the state, the better uh, prepared the state will be to meet the needs of the healthcare field. So we do have those programs. MSU does offer their BSN in nursing. We actually partnered with them in about 2001 or two, and they didn't have any nursing um, opportunities at the baccalaureate level for students other than students who could move to Missoula or Billings or Great Falls, I think, at that point. Even Bozeman didn't have the clinical opportunity, I think, at that point for students. So um, they've been wonderful in being able to expand the opportunities for students at the baccalaureate level. But as we've all continued to grow our nursing programs to better meet the needs of the state, one of the challenges is meeting the um, criteria of the Board of Nursing, who also set what we're allowed to do in terms of nursing education, and they're the ones that also provide approval of our programs, as well as the Board of Regents. And because of that limited ability for clinical sites, because each hospital or medical community in which we all work and serve, you can only have so many students in the hospital involved in clinical sites, and I think we're all looking at new ways to provide those clinical opportunities as education continues to grow and expand. But those of us who have programs and have more than one um, college or university providing programs in the same area, it's critical that we work together and collaborate on how we can continue to offer those opportunities for all of our students and continue to meet the needs of the medical communities across the state and the healthcare communities. Thank you. Um, yeah. Oh, President Cruzado, go ahead. Yeah, um, the only thing I, I will add is um, is that emphasis on collaboration. Two, two things, when, when I first arrived six years ago and I had my listening and learning sessions all over the state, when I visited Kalispell and I stopped at Flathead Valley, the, the afternoon before, Jane joined me for a meeting with citizens in Kalispell where we discussed this this collaboration. So you can rest assured that as nursing goes, what's happening is the same faculty, the same people are sitting around the same table and having these conversations. The other thing that it's absolutely important for me to underline is that nursing in many ways is a very unique program. And campuses that, that have programs in nursing, you need to understand that they do it because it's a labor of love. The nursing profession is a labor of love. And supporting and sustaining programs in nursing, it's also a labor of love. They are exceedingly expensive programs that need a huge level of subsidies on the part of the institution in order uh, for us to be able to offer them. So in, in the case of Montana State University, Every year, we subsidize our nursing programs all around the state at a very high level. The other uh, reality that's important is quality. And, and these programs need to meet very stringent quality standards. So here's, here's the, the, the difficult situation that we have. We want to meet the needs of the state at the same time they're very expensive programs to operate. And in addition to that, we need to make sure that every program needs those uh, quality standards. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about any of the level two items? Casey. <clears throat> just a comment. Um, I just wanted to recognize and, and show appreciation for um, the emails that we receive um, on a 
I think all of us received on a number of these different proposals. Um, I think it was very helpful hearing information from the industry and from the business sector of how some of these uh, potential programs would impact them and how they would get involved. So I just wanted to thank them. Casey, I presume you're talking about the culinary arts programs at Gallatin and at MSU, and I agree those were very helpful. Fran? Yep. Um, question on two different points. Uh, back to the nursing, uh, President Cruzado, um, is it the intent to that uh, there will be a, you're creating a pathway for matriculation from the, um, the associates into the BSN program at Flathead Valley into your? I'm not aware of, of those pathways, but Jean might be more knowledgeable about that. Madam Chair, Regent Albrecht, uh, the program at, uh, in Kellispell, that MSU has in Kellispell is a standalone BSN program, so they admit 16 BSN students a year. So it's, it's not designed to be an ASN to BSN completion program, but it's, it's designed for a student to, uh, once admitted, uh, proceed all the way to the BSN. Another question, Fran? Yes, please. Uh, and then um, could you speak, uh, Deputy Commissioner Suck, uh, with regard to the, um, how, do, how you look at, so for example, the, uh, commu the community college programs with, say, with culinary, for example, um, how, where those folks are, uh, they look at enrollment as far as um, where they draw from so that we can be assured that these kind of programs are actually meeting the needs throughout um, the state and that that's not pulling necessarily from other programs. Can you speak to that? Regent, or Chair Sheehy, uh, Regent Albrecht, uh, your question is in reference to the uh, Gallatin College MSU Culinary Arts Program. Um, the, uh, the nature of a two-year college is, is really to serve its, its local uh, and regional community. And, and uh, so typically a, a, a very large percentage of, of the enrollment at a two-year college comes from within a, roughly a 75 to 100 mile radius of, of that campus. So um, the, with respect to the culinary arts programs, we, as we know, we have two very successful culinary arts programs in western Montana, the Flathead, and in Missoula, but we're really lacking anything east of, of the Continental Divide. And so I, I believe what MSU and Gallatin College are looking at is establishing a culinary arts program in Bozeman that would really be designed to serve the region uh, surrounding the Bozeman area. Any other questions about the level two memorandum? No? Let's move on to our next item. John, I don't have that in front of me. Chair Sheehy. That part of my internet just left me. Let's try this. Yes. Chair Sheehy, that would oh, be the uh, uh, notifications. notifications and level one approvals. There we are, it's right up above my head. Information item E. And Chair Sheehy, uh, members of the board, uh, the, as we discussed earlier, the level one proposals are those that involve minor changes and may be approved by the commissioner. This process first involves the vetting by the campuses via the CAOs and the CAO calls that we hold. And uh, I can assure you these uh, proposals have been reviewed by the CAOs via our February, via my February 10 memo, and then the discussion we had two weeks ago. Um, and um, they are ready to move forward, and, and I think all issues, uh, if there were any, were addressed. Those are all stated, and we've all read this. Um, anybody have any comments or questions regarding the notification and level one approval? Seeing none, uh, there's no further business before this committee and it's adjourned. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Uh, we will now take a 15 minute break. Thank, Thank you. you. We will now reconvene the meeting of the Board of Regents and I will turn the meeting over to Regent Johnstone for the Staff and Compensation Committee. Regent Johnstone. Thank you, Chair Tuff. Um, before we, um, as you can see, uh, we only have consented items on our agenda. Um, one of the goals of our committee uh, before I 
move off of the chair roll is to actually have an action item on the committee. So. <laughs> 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 We'll, we'll work on that for future meetings. Uh, but before uh, I ask the committee members or, or the other members of the board whether there are any items on the consent agenda that they would like to be moved to action, I'd like to ask Deputy Commissioner McCray to perhaps give us an overview of the items, uh, identify any that you think uh, are information that we should be aware of, and then perhaps discuss a little bit the the uh, process of negotiation of the collective bargaining agreements, if you would, please. Certainly. Thank you, Chairman Johnstone. The consent agenda before you consists of, uh, typ typically, as it would, staff items, labor agreements, and emeriti faculty. So the staff items uh, consist of a proposal at Western for a uh, temporary stipend for an individual who for an interim is serving as both the athletic director and the head football coach. Uh, we also have a MSU Billings item for the hire of a new volleyball coach. We have an MSU Northern item for the, the normal salary increase of 2% for a uh, head football coach. And then we have the hiring, uh, recommended hiring of a deputy commissioner, as we heard yesterday. The labor agreements, we have seven agreements on the agenda. Um, all of the agreements consist of uh, the economic package and, and settlement for classified hourly uh, employees or, or bargaining units that consist of classified hourly employees would be for a 50 cent per hour raise. Uh, retroactive to January and then another 50 cent per hour next January consistent with the agreements that you've approved and then there's a faculty uh, agreement on there as well that contains the uh, material economic component is for the the two percent raise consistent with the other agreements you've approved and then uh, before I circle back to the bargaining update, the rest of the consent agenda then is we have five uh, faculty emeriti uh, awards, nominations, and um, we had a discussion in staff and comp committee, for kind of a refresher of uh, how that process works, the emeriti, uh, and it typically uh, uh, begins at the department level when usually a, a long time serving faculty member is at the retirement uh, stage and um, is nominated at the department level and the faculty member's peers uh, write an emeritus statement and it, it goes through the review process up through the university, uh, lands on our agenda as a recommendation from the presidents and, and then comes to the board. So that's the, the consent agenda. Excuse me, Deputy yes. Commissioner. Perhaps before you go into the process, uh, we can consider whether any of the uh, committee members would like to move any item off the uh, consent agenda. Any other board members like to move any item off the consent agenda? Thank you. Please. Okay. The uh, status of collective bargaining in this cycle, this contract term, uh, some of us might recall that the duration or the term of our bargaining agreements corresponds to the two-year budget biennium. So that means for the, the, uh, the contract term that we are bargaining for now began July 1st of, of 2015 and will end June 30th of 2017. So we are uh, approaching halfway into that term. And we have settled uh, 21 of 25 agreements uh, 10 of 12, eight of 10 faculty agreements. So the, the two largest bargaining units that we are still negotiating with are the uh, faculty bargaining, uh, collective bargaining units at UM Western and at MSU Northern. Um, in the committee, we had some discussion uh, the, the earlier committee meeting about maybe some of the factors that are, what, what are some of the issues or factors contributing to uh, some outstanding unsettled agreements. I did some quick homework and I, I saw that two years ago at this time, um, we did not have settled agreements yet at UM Western or at MSU Northern. We did by May. And it's not that we don't begin bargaining uh, <laughs> later at, at those units. Um, th there are some circumstances that uh, sort of traditionally contribute 
to, in the end, every set of negotiations has some difficult issues that, that you settle at the end. And um, to that degree, we had a discussion about four years ago. And I, I guess because we have turnover and new administrators and new board members, um, I, I can touch on that uh, a, a little bit right now to, to kind of give you some perspective. Um, also, uh, the Bureau of Mines director, the state geologist, uh, yesterday had a great analogy about uh, crossing the pond by stepping on turtles. And I'll see if I can do that in this discussion and stay dry. So the, the chancellors and their provosts are going to know what I'm talking about, but I'll, I'll stay general. Uh, on our four-year campuses, six four-year campuses, when it comes to our tradition and our environment uh, and, and faculty salary issues and collective bargaining, uh, two of the six four-year campuses have some different dynamics than the other four when, when it comes to uh, salary concerns, salary issues. And it's not always for, I would, I would say, not bad reasons. Um, the two bargaining units that have not settled yet have roughly 70 faculty at the institution and in the bargaining unit. And there are some differences in, in climate and psychology at, at an institution of, of this size compared to maybe an institution that has 500 or 600 faculty. And I would say that uh, I'd venture to guess that uh, uh, a collective bargaining unit that has 500 or 600 faculty, you could easily have a professor of business in that bargaining unit who would have a 30-year career at that institution and maybe never meet an English professor. But the other two campuses that I've mentioned where we're still negotiating, if you're a professor of business, by the end of your career, you've probably been to a barbecue in the backyard of the, the every English professor. And so some of the dynamics deal with real and perceived equity and, um, well, primarily, primarily equity and, and, and in terms of how we apply uh, salary raises and how we determine hiring rates. So at four of those six campuses in Bozeman, Billings, Butte, Missoula, it is long established and accepted that faculty salaries vary widely by academic discipline based on the market. In other words, it's established and accepted by both the faculty and the administration that the a salary for a professor of languages is going to be substantially different than the salary for a professor of nursing or, or business. At two of the campuses, the two where we're still negotiating, uh, it does not seem as acceptable that salary differences or dramatic salary differences by discipline are at least uh, to, to, to all parties at the table uh, as important to recruiting and retaining faculty. Uh, w whether it seems acceptable, it definitely is not as established on those two campuses in those bargaining units. Also at two of the the six units, four-year units, uh, well, at four of them, Bozeman, Butte, Missoula, Billings, we have accepted, acceptable, and established procedures for faculty merit pay. In fact, at every two-year campus, we also have pools for faculty merit pay. So as we discussed last May, and we've been discussing all year as, under the board's direction, as we work towards reaching an agreement with faculty on a normal salary increase, you have also directed us to be as flexible as we can, working towards some additional pools for uh, things like uh, merit and inversion, compression, mitigation, and so forth, and market. Um, at Western and at Northern, for reasons I don't know, but uh, I can attest to for 11 years, when we have proposed market or merit pools and, and the concept of uh, pay for faculty merit, which on the campuses where we do have merit pool, it gives faculty an opportunity to put together a portfolio uh, of accomplishments over the, the most recent two-year period, three-year period, depending on how the merit cycle works, and have beneficial opportunity then to improve their compensation through the dis display of meritorious work. And for some reason, we have never been able to develop an interest in merit pay uh, at the two campuses where we're still bargaining. I, I do believe some of it comes down to the collegiality 
uh, and the uh, more close-knit uh, nature uh, of the smaller campus. And that's where sometimes people get sensitive to, to variable pay. Uh, bottom line is at both the campuses where we're still bargaining, we generally have an agreement that, I mean, we don't have any signed agreements yet, but it's not so much the concept that the 2% normal salary increase is a problem, but how do we then come to agreements on the rest of the enhancement pool, where elsewhere it largely goes to merit. And, and, and right now, what our tradition has been, and where we're sitting right now with these open agreements, is the Board of Regents bargaining team is being asked to spend more than perhaps we think we can on alternatives to merit pay. And that is essentially, at one campus, longevity pay that uh, has a formula where you get a, a quote point for every year of service that's worth approximately $382. And then on, on the other campus, rather than uh, a merit pool, um, we are negotiating the size, the expenditure, the amount of a market pool um, that there are such, there is such thing as market raises in some of our other bargaining units, but the market pool in this case is really essentially distributed as almost an across the board raise to almost all faculty because it um, pays attention to uh, salary surveys by rank, but with no regard to, to discipline. So what we're really doing in those two sets of negotiations, I think we're pretty close on the normal salary increase, but we still have some differences on how much we think we can afford to pay on concepts of either longevity or largely across the board market raises that don't uh, address some of the, the true discipline specific market differences. We do have some concerns like we do every two years that where we do not have settled bargaining agreements at this time, we are approaching what's called the uh, state of Montana's state government uh, personnel services snapshot. So in all the budget discussions that we had yesterday about our budget priorities, legislative priorities for uh, strong state funding and a, and a state employee pay plan, <clears throat> this May, the Governor's Office of Budget and Program Planning will be taking the budget snapshot of the campuses. And that truly is just a snapshot of what are the current wage and salary levels of all employees on the campuses, and that snapshot will then form the basis of the development of any future state employee pay plan in terms of applying percentage increases to it that would then result in any appropriation to the university system. So we do have a detrimental impact if we do not get all of our settlements uh, done and the money in people's paychecks in time for that snapshot in May. But uh, like I said, uh, we're not alarmed because two years ago, um, <laughs> We did not have all of our bargaining agreements settled. We had uh, had them settled in May, so we'll see what uh, this May brings us. We are at the, at the table on your behalf. The bargaining agents for faculty and the faculty themselves on the bargaining team are bargaining in good faith uh, on their behalf, and, and the process is uh, working. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. I, I thought it was important to get a little bit more context and color, and so I appreciate that. Uh, we, we obviously are sensitive to and appreciate that we don't negotiate these agreements uh, at the board level, but I thought the board deserves some more information. We appreciate it. Does anybody have any uh, questions uh, for Deputy Commissioner McCray? Any questions on any of the items? If not, may we move the consent item to the action item? Any objection to that? We will do so. Uh, is there any other business before the Staff and Compensation Committee? Actually, appreciate it if somebody would suggest some, but. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Martha. <laughs> I just want to say, Bill, that as a guy with a humanities degree who's managed to get a few jobs, my money's on you that you'll have an action item before it's all over. Thank you. Hearing none, I think that concludes the uh, work of the Staff and Compensation Committee. Thank you, Chair Tess. Thank you, uh, Regent Johnstone. Uh, we will now move into 
uh, action on the various items from the four committees that we have. Um, and just to let folks know, I'm, I'm unsure about how long this will take. Um, we do have a comment, public comment period scheduled for 11.30. Uh, it will be my intention if we do end uh, our action items prior to the time of that public comment period, we will take a recess and we will come back at precisely 11.30 for public comment. I just wanted folks to know that. So with that uh, as a notice, let us move on to um, action for the various uh, items in our budget committee uh, chaired by Regent Albrecht. We have uh, items A through F on the budget committee which are consent items. Is there a motion to move these items? So moved. There is a motion on the floor to move items A through F on the consent agenda. Um, is there any uh, further uh, comment from members of the board, from campuses or the public on these items? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes. We are now at action item a, Budget Committee, authorization to name the Engineering and Physical Sciences Building, MSU Bozeman. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. It's been moved. Is there any additional comments from members of the board, from campuses, or the public? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion carries. Uh, action item B, authorization to construct Museum of the Rockies collection slash storage facility, MSU Bozeman. Is there a motion? So moved. You've heard the motion. Uh, is there any additional comments from members of the board, from campuses, or the public? Any additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Uh, action item C, authorization to renovate Matthews Hall restrooms, <coughs> UM Western. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. You've heard the motion by Regent Albrecht. Is there any additional comments? Regent Meister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if there's the potential that uh, the company I work for would be involved in any type of financing arrangement for item C, the Matthews Hall restrooms, or the uh, uh, third floor research facility, I think I will abstain from item C and E. Thank you. Thank you, Regent. Uh, Commissioner? Mr. Chair, although the approval of this item isn't conditioned on financing or any finance options have been chosen. I will say that the last few placements have been with local banks in Montana and certainly your uh, bank has been included in that. So, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a conflict on this item as um, it's, it's not depending on that relationship at all, but um, certainly up to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Regent Johnson? No. Oh, okay. Um, are there any additional comments from members of the board, from the campuses, or the public on this item? Any additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Are there any abstentions? Regent Nystuen will be noted as an abstention. Uh, action item D. Authorization to transfer property from the University of Montana Western Foundation to the University of Montana Western, an item brought to us by UM Western. Is there a motion to approve? I'd so move. You've heard the motion by Regent Nystuen. Is there any additional comments from members of the board, from campuses, or the public? Any additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Action item E, uh, complete remaining research space at third floor ISB, UM Missoula. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. You've heard the motion. Uh, is there any additional comments 
from members of the board, from the campuses, or the public? Any additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion <coughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion carries. Oh, I'm sorry, you're, you're abstaining. So, so noted, uh, Regent Eisden. Thank you for that. Okay, let us move on to uh, the next committee. And we have nothing from the two-year committee uh, to act on. We will go to ARSA. And on the ARSA committee agenda, we have the consent uh, item, just, just the one, the level two memorandum that we did go through um, earlier. Is there a motion from the board to approve the consent agenda? So. Thank you, uh, Regent Lozar. Are, are there any additional comments from members of the board, from campuses, or the public on this item? Any additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the ayes have it. We will now move on to the action items uh, of this particular committee. And the first one is the honorary doctorate from UM uh, Missoula. And this is the honorary doctorate for uh, J.K. Simmons. Uh, are, are the, is there a motion to approve? Moved. You, there, there's a motion on the floor uh, to approve action item A. Is there any additional comments from members of the board, from campuses, or the public? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Action item B, honorary doctorate from UM Missoula, and this is the honorary doctorate for Jack Ward Thomas. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. It's been moved by Regent Albrecht. Uh, is there any additional comments from members of the board, from campuses, or the public? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes. Action item C, honorary doctorate from MSU Bozeman, and this is the honorary doctorate for Will Weaver from Great Falls. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. There's, there's a motion on the floor. Did you get that? Amy. Regent Johnston. Is there any additional comments from members of the board, campuses, or the public on this? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes. Uh, action item D, honorary doctorate from MSU Bozeman, and this is for Gene Sweeney. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. <laughs> the motion from Regent Nystuen. Thank you, Regent Nystuen. Uh, any additional comments from members of the board, from campuses, or the public? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Congratulations to all four of these outstanding individuals. Um, we're now on to action item E, mission statement and vision statement revision, Great Falls College, MSU. Is there a motion to approve? So. It's been moved by Regent Lozar. Uh, is there any additional comments from members of the board, from campuses, or the public? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Now, when it comes to the next several items, is it appropriate to have one universal uh, motion to, they're all interconnected, right? Uh, so my thought is to have one universal motion to approve uh, items F through K, is that correct? Yes. Is that? That's correct. Okay, is, is that the intent of the board and acceptable to the board? Yes. Okay. Do we have a motion then on the table to approve items F through K? So moved. It's been moved by Regent Sheehy. Are there any additional comments from members of the board? Regent Johnston. Yes. Thank you, Chair Tuss. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to support the motion, but I, I would make two observations that I think came out of our conversation earlier. One, 
that we need to continue to review this to see how it works yeah. and, and be willing to do so promptly and quickly. Um, and secondly, uh, unrelated to the motion, but I, I do believe we need to take a fresh look at our committee process. And I would hope that we would do that over the next uh, several months to see whether <clears throat> the committee meeting process, the interim meeting process is working as effectively as it can. Thank you, Regent Johnstone, for those comments. Are there any additional comments from members of the board, from the campuses, or the public? Are there any additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion carries. Thank you. And now uh, we are to Regent Johnstone's committee, the consent committee. We have several consent S items. Soon to be named the action committee. Oh, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be full of action and haver, trust me. <laughs> there are several items on the consent agenda that we just went through. Um, is there a motion to approve these consent items? So moved. It's been moved by Regent Johnstone. Are there any additional comments from members of the board, from the campuses, or the public? Um. Yes, Regent Chair Albrecht. Tuss, I would just like to um, extend my um, warm congratulations and welcome to um, our incoming Deputy Commissioner, uh, Chuck Jensen, and to note that you and I had the pleasure of interviewing um, the finalists for that position, and uh, we're delighted that um, in the decision, and we're confident moving forward. So I appreciated the opportunity to be part of that interview process. That's an important notation, and it was a, it was a good process. Uh, any additional comments from members of the board, uh, from the campuses, or the public on this consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the motion carries. We're ahead of schedule. Um, we do have public comment, as I mentioned, uh, scheduled for uh, 11.30. Uh, we have several folks in the audience. I'm not sure that we have public comment there, but um, let us take a nine-minute break or an eight-minute break. Um, we can certainly we can certainly ask for comment at this point, but we will but we will stay here until 11.30. Um, is there any public comment at this point? Yes, please. We've seen you before. Chair Welcome. Chair Tuss, members of the board, uh, I am Bill Worry, a chair of faculty senate at the University of Montana. And I'm also a professor in the Parks, Tourism and Recreation Management Program at the University of Montana. And I wish to speak to the proposal for a hospitality management Bachelor of Science degree, which is on your level two memorandum. We are a group of uh, seven faculty uh, pursuing excellence now for 40 years in parks, tourism and recreation management research. Three focus on parks and outdoor recreation and four focus on the tourism side. But tourism in the state of Montana is primarily outdoors and nature based from the two flagship national parks, Glacier and Yellowstone National Park to the mountains and the plains. Visitors look to the natural beauty as a highlight of their trips to our great state. Our tourism faculty are nationally and internationally renowned. In fact, two are currently in India teaching ecotourism workshops similar to the courses that they teach in our Bachelor of Science program. They published industry standard textbooks cutting edge research volumes, and they've been recognized repeatedly by Travel Montana, by Montana's Office of Tourism and Business Development, by the National Travel and Tourism Research Association. Our research is in high demand, particularly those documenting the economic impacts of tourism and outdoor recreation in our state. In fact, most of the statistics about tourism in Montana come from our group at the University of Montana. 
We work closely with BBER, the Bureau of Business and Economic Research in the School of Business Administration. Our tourism students intern and get jobs throughout the state from the Yellowstone Club, the Big Sky Community Corporation, Zantera Parks and Resorts, Glacier Park Incorporated, conventions and visitors bureaus, to the very many guiding and outfitting companies throughout the state. We're proud of what we've contributed over 40 years, and we look forward to training leaders in tourism and supporting tourism in the state of Montana for another 40 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Additional public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Levi Berkey, and I'm the president of the Associated Students of Montana State University in Bozeman. I stand before you to voice student support for the proposed culinary arts and hospitality management degrees at MSU. As a fourth generation Montanan, first generation college student, and future educator, I personally have a vested interest in the quality of public education in our state. I wouldn't be here where I am today without the support of those closest to me which I would po posit is the case for almost everyone in this room. One of those fervent supporters of mine is, surprise, my mom, Gaylene Berkey. Uh, she worked in the travel agency, uh, Montana Tour and Travel, located in the Flathead Valley until she recently retired after 27 years in the profession. A sentiment that my mother shares with other business owners in the tourism industry is the need for professionally trained employees in Montana. The culinary arts and hospitality management degrees provide an education that meets this workforce deficit. The process preceding the arrival of these programs to the Board of Regents has been unique. In an unprecedented step, Student Senate vetted both programs. In our final meeting of consideration, we came together for a five-hour meeting of vibrant public comment and Senate deliberation, resulting in a formal resolution resoundingly endorsing both programs. Part of our land grant mission at MSU is to offer educational opportunities to meet the state workforce needs. Industry leaders have stated a need for graduates of these programs. Students at MSU, the ones who will ultimately enroll in these programs, have stated a need for these programs. I stand here not at the behest of the administration or the industry. I stand here because I'm in a role representing 15,688 students at Montana State University, and our position is clear. The culinary arts and hospitality management degrees will be a valuable addition to our campus, community, and state. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and for being here today. Additional public comments. Good morning. I'm Colleen Kaiser, and I am director of the Montana Dietetic Internship Program at Montana State. However, today, it's my pleasure to be here as the incoming president of the Montana Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. The Montana Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics strongly supports a hospitality program degree at Montana State University. The accrediting organizations for dietetic education recently examined dietetic food service management competencies and identified areas that educational programs need to address in order to meet enhanced standards in future student preparation. Noted areas of significance to the MSU hospitality program include leadership and management skills, food, basic food preparation and culinary skills, and sustainable practices in food and nutrition services. Curriculum resources in dietetics and the hospitality program degree support achievement in these areas and will positively impact the practice of dietetics in Montana and the Mountain West. A strong area of employment for registered dietitian nutritionists is food service management. The intersection of individual and community health as it relates to a well-functioning, vibrant food system is a unique approach to create a healthier population. The courses in the MSU Hospitality Management degree specifically related to culinary arts and to the farm-to-table sourcing meet dietetic performance competencies and will strengthen the profession and those being prepared for uh, work settings that are emerging and innovative. The existing dietetic program and the new hospitality program are mutually supportive. 
Montana is a state well positioned to have a profound impact in the arenas of rural economic development, environmental stewardship, and human well being. MSU has the opportunity to fulfill its highest land grant mission charge in preparing individuals that meet the demand for college educated workers in these industries throughout the hospitality management, through the hospitality management program. MSU dietetic students and graduates lead the workforce and excel in many employment sectors as most certainly will be the case with future graduates given the building blocks that enhance programming and resources provided by a new hospitality management degree. Thank you for the opportunity to state this support. Thank you very much. Additional public comment. Mr. Arviscal, welcome. Not so heavy on the Mr. Arviscal though. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, Board of Regents, I have a, just a few comments. You're probably wondering what, what Steve come all the way to Dillon from Billings for? And I've been very intrigued by this process. Uh, I want to offer some comments of encouragement for what's happening on our, on our campus and in our community of Billings. But I was also over here because I had a friendly debt to pay off with my nephew. I lost a bet on a game, a Billings Central versus Dillon last fall, and so it took me this long to pay it off, and so these two, th two responsibilities <laughs> merged, and I'm here today to, to talk with you. I had another bet in this process with my sister-in-law. It was Montana Tech versus Western, and I won that bet, uh, <laughs> Chancellor. I, I want to I comment on this. This morning, I was very moved by the presentation, as I know many of you were, and I would just comment to Zach. Uh, a fellow ore digger, very proud to call him a colleague. Uh, it, it reminds me that life is not lived on a straight line, and it's all about how well we finish. And uh, please share with Zach uh, support from another fellow digger for, for his life. So with that said, um, uh, we, uh, I'm here to su really support what's happening both in our community and, and at Montana State University Billings and thank you for your encouragement and your support to our chancellor and to that part of the system and our part of the state. It's very important to us. The strength of our university uh, in Billings is an important aspect of our economic growth as a community. We need a very strong and growing vibrant university there. Uh, we are in the process of working with Dr. Nook. He has reached out to us. We are partnering with him on many things, but in particular on his efforts to do strategic planning for vision and direction for Montana State University Billings. And it could not come at a better time, actually, as we're faced with really throughout the state issues related to workforce, issues related to a changing energy environment and, and how we're going to provide a reliable, affordable source of energy long term for, for industry going forward. So the work that he will be leading in our community in partnership with the community to look at a strategic vision for Montana State University is very important to us and it will be an economic driver uh, uh, for our community. And I want to use one example of how important this work will be for us. 25% of the active labor force in our community is either directly or indirectly related to health care. Health care in our community is a $2.6 billion industry and growing, and growing at a very rapid pace. And as the dialogue, I was very interested in the dialogue you had about nursing programs and where that might go. A uh, comment was made about looking at this comprehensively. Where are we headed in the delivery of training for a growing need for workforce? Uh, and if you have not read this, and many of you I'm assuming have, the last outlook report from the Bureau of Economic uh, Research in, in Missoula, I'm going to give you a number from page 20 of this report, 15,557. And that is the number of health care jobs that need to be filled between now and 2024. Um, I want to thank you for your work with our campus on the RN to BSN program. That's just a small step in a more comprehensive process that I'm hopeful that you engage in and that I'm hopeful our campus will be a, a very important part of that. As a side note, my wife is a nurse, an RN for 22 years, 
she's going through an RN to BSN program right now. I talk to Mark about that often. I'm just going to encourage the people who put these curriculums together. Um, those nurses are working 10, 12-hour shifts, and then when they come home, uh, they get to go on the computer and do classwork. And if for no other reasons, just to support the husbands of, of, of those wives uh, or, or spouses, however that might work, it's got to be flexible, it's got to be affordable, and it's got to work with their life, both their work life and, and family life. So just a personal encouragement as you look at what you're doing with the delivery of uh, important training, education for, for uh, uh uh, our healthcare workforce. Big number, 15,557 in eight years. Lastly, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Christian, also Commissioner Sack, uh, for allowing us to partner with uh, Dr. Kurt Lacey. Uh, he's very active in our Billings Works uh, uh, initiative, and he's, he's a real resource that we lean on quite, quite heavily for his expertise and guidance in the work that we're doing. And if you didn't know, our Billings Works initiative is really private sector driven. Uh, we have a very large round table. Most of our participants, in addition to our stakeholders and educators that are around that table, are the private sector. They participate on our steering committee, on our regular council meetings, but most importantly, they tell us what's happening on the streets in their business every single day. In 2015, we produced our first state of the workforce report. Uh, some of you may have seen this. Uh, we're in the process of producing the 2016 report. That is information that comes directly from the private sector in our region and our marketplace. Through an employer survey that we launched, through focus groups with industry sectors, they're telling us specifically in this report what their needs are. So when our 2016 report rolls out, we'll make sure the appropriate folks get that report. That is a driver of workforce development strategy in our community. And uh, if it can be beneficial to the work that you're doing as our Board of Regents uh, and our higher education system, we'd be, we'd be happy to share that, that with you. With those comments, I just want to thank you. Thank you for letting me kind of be a fly on the wall today and observe your process and offer these public comments. We're a champion of what's happening uh, under Dr. Nook's leadership. We look forward to the strategic planning process. It is vital to our economic uh, diversity and future going forward in our region. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Additional public comments. Additional public comments. Oh. I wonder what he's going to talk about. <laughs> I'll bet I know. Good morning. Yeah, by, by my attire, I hope you realize I'm here on the, on the behalf of the culinary program. My name's Mike Dean. I'm the executive sous chef for Zantera Parks and Resorts in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, again, working with the, the Bozeman Group on the, the culinary arts and the hospitality programs. Um, I've been working in Yellowstone for 30 years. I started as a, a dishwasher in 1986. Uh, I came up through the ranks. Uh, I have learned to appreciate the, the, the training and the hard work and the, the enthusiasm that culinary people have in the kitchens. Uh, I've, I became a certified executive chef 17 years ago. Um, in, in that role, it's, it's my obligation as a professional certified chef to give back, to educate, to help develop the, the next generation of our chefs. Um, the, the sheer numbers of, of people and meals that we serve in Yellowstone, everybody knows the, the numbers. Yellowstone visitation was 4 million people. We as a company in Yellowstone served 2 million, 2.1 million meals over last summer. Um, the, the, the hiring that we do, I hire 12 restaurant chefs on a seasonal basis, 27 seasonal sous chefs, uh, and hundreds of other culinary operations. Um, we also look at, again, the, the, the partnership between the culinary side and the hospitality management side. Um, I, I can cook food, but I need somebody else to manage the property, to check people in, to take care of the lodging. So the, the diversity of, of those opportunities is phenomenal in Yellowstone alone. And again, as, as a representative of Zantera Parks and Resorts, we also were awarded the concession contract in Glacier a couple of years ago for the next 16 years. 
Sometimes I feel that my partners in Glacier and I are competing for the same small resource of culinarians and hospitality people. So I think the, the, the potential for development of this, this uh, culinary hospitality program in Bozeman is huge. We can, we can offer jobs, we can, can provide dozens of internship programs, externship programs. So I think the, the, the positives are uh, huge profound impact on the, 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 the area, the region that we work, uh, and fully supporting any, anything that we can move forward with this program. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Is there additional public comment? Uh, <clears throat> Jeff Krauss, uh, Bozeman, Montana. Um, Chair Tuss, uh, Commissioner, my friends and colleagues on the Board of Regents, my friends in the Commissioner's Office, it's good to see you. A big shout out to the people in the back tables back there. Uh, thank you so much for all your hard work. Uh, President Nook, I'm flying the, the MSUB today. I know that's not the right appellation, but <clears throat> it works. Um, I know you're asking yourself, how can we miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> and, and I promise uh, I'll stop showing up uh, just as soon as Dr. Wadhead Cruzado and the Bozeman MSU community stop coming up with innovative and progressive proposals. Um, I, I, I think I'm here, uh, I rise, as they say somewhere, uh, I rise to support the, the two um, uh, degrees, the associate's degree and the hospitality degree that are proposed today. Um, and, uh, I, and I don't have a whole lot to, to say, I think, when you hear from the people in the industry, as you have by email, but it's always nice to have a few people take the time to show up and uh, talk about this. Uh, uh, I, I have a couple of statistics from the Institute for Tourism and Recreation Research. Thank you very much for your research and paying attention to one of the critical uh, industries in the state of Montana. That, By the way, that's from the University of Montana, I know. Some of you know that, right? But I uh, thought I'd call that out. And I, and, uh, and I also wanted to call out uh, uh, Regent uh, Nystuen uh, uh, um, because he's a banker, and I like having a banker on the Board of Regents because bankers go where the money is and bankers tend to find the towns that are growing and the industries that are growing and make big bets on those towns and industries. So it's great to have one there. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that point of view. Um, I think that in 2014, total spending by non-residents um, in the state of Montana was something like $3,791,870,000. Yeah, I got anyway, somewhere in there, 3.8 billion basically, and uh, and and it was and it's interesting. I think uh, I, I know uh, Regent Nystuen's history with uh, Flathead Valley Community College, and he obviously took his banker's philosophy with him to the college as he ran that and Jane Karras too, because they have a very successful culinary arts program there, and I I was privileged enough to go eat there and spend some time there. Um, uh, last year, and uh, and it is very successful, and I think that one of the reasons for that is is Flathead County is the number one county for non-resident spending in the state, number one, and uh, and, and and so it is a natural place to have um, that kind of spending. For example, um, $668 million of total non-resident spending in Flathead County. Um, restaurant and bar spending in 2014 in one year um, in Flathead County, $135 million. Uh, hotels and motels, another 58 and a half million and retail sales from non-resident spending, uh, I believe was uh, 170 Three million dollars. So it's a huge industry there. Um, in contrast, for example, to you know, I thought, well, uh, you know, that that retail sales is great, but we got a huge uh, 
uh, um, uh, city in, in Montana, our, our brawny shouldered energy and medical and retail trade center down in Yellowstone County, and, and they're, they're bound to be bigger, and yet their non-resident spending on retail is 91 million. Their restaurant and bar spending is 77.6 million. Um, and so there, there is a very different degree of that, uh, of that um, there. And so when you talk about uh, one of the things that came up today, I noticed in your discussion was um, the sort of the, the 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 need for this kind of industry and the need for this kind of uh, of uh, uh, two-year program is, is is somewhat drawn from the area you're in. And, uh, and yet we have a very successful culinary arts and, and, and uh, tourism programs at, at, at the University of Montana. Uh, Missoula, for example, um, has $285 million of non-resident uh, spending in a year, um, compared to that 668, remember. Um, only 57 million in restaurant and bar, and yet they have a very uh, successful culinary arts program there. Um, you knew at some point in time I was gonna get around to some other county in the state um, and talk about the county in which uh, Montana State University and Gallatin College exist. Gallatin College, an embedded two-year college inside the four-year university, and coming up with a innovative idea that uh, takes the embedded nature of the two-year college and builds an Associates of Applied Science culinary arts degree and builds on top of that a hospitality degree that covers a number of other alternatives. And you've heard people from the industry talk about that. Uh, Gallatin County um, has total non-resident spending of $662 million a year. And we did um, just edge out um, Flathead County and restaurant and bar spending. Could be the college students, I don't know. Uh, $136.8 million in restaurant and bar spending by non-residents last 2014. Hotel and motel, 58 point, uh, well, excuse me, 67 million um, in uh, hotel and motel spending by non-residents and retail sales of $116 million. So, um, <clears throat> you know, this is in a very important industry in the area and in the town that I used to be mayor of, right? A very important industry. And yet we hear all the time that we are under training or we're underserving our um, employers. You need to um, uh, focus the way the bankers do and take these programs to the people that need them, the industries that will support them. One of the reasons Flathead Valley Community College is so successful is that they have incredible support from their community and, and the program of culinary arts is one of them. I, I point at the two leaders here. They're, they share in that success, but, but that's one of the reasons, and, and we have lined up, uh, I think, uh, a, a number of people either emailing you or writing you letters or coming here today to talk about the support for that industry um, for these two programs. And so um, uh, <clears throat> I, I would just uh, ask you to wholeheartedly support these two programs. We, we, um, are, uh, we have seven new hotels proposed in the city of Bozeman, seven new hotels, right? We just opened, you know, several last year. And, uh, and no, none of them are out by the airport. They're all in the city of Bozeman. So I, I would tell you that, that hospitality, when it comes to these kind of things, uh, um, we need managers, we need entrepreneurs. I think one of the things that I saw in the discussions of these previous to this was, well, the wages are low. Well, let me tell you, we have the Jake Jab School of Business and Entrepreneurship at Montana State University, which can teach these um, students also how to be entrepreneurs and, and that, and the industry itself, the, the tourism industry is, uh, I think, uniquely suited to entrepreneurship. The people open restaurants, they open bars, they, op they open bed and breakfast, they open retail shops, they open manufacturing places, all of which appeal to the non-residents. All of that money coming in from out of state into the state of Montana and supporting all of our residents here. So I would ask you, please... Um, uh, I, I don't have any. I, I still have a student. In, I still have a student in college. I'm still writing those checks. Um, so, as a consumer, and also as a, um, uh, a member of the public, I would ask you to please give your wholehearted support for 
um, these two proposals. I think they will uh, do you credit in the years to come. Uh, just uh, one last thing. I did mention that I still have a, um, a son at Montana State University, and I think he is in the, um, the School of Computing, or he soon will be. So thank you for that as well. It's good to see you, Jeff. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? My name is Mike Hope. Uh, I'm a proud uh, Montana State graduate, business, 1987. I started out in the hospitality industry when I was 14 years old as a dishwasher. I'll never forget, I went home and I told my dad I was living in Minneapolis at the time. He said, Dad, I got a job. He says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to be a dishwasher. He says, well, you're not old enough. I said, well, I lied about my age. <laughs> Flash forward two weeks, I came home. I said, Dad, you're right. I wasn't old enough. I want to quit. <laughs> he says, you know what? You weren't old enough, but I'll tell you when you can quit. Well, 40 plus years later, I'm still in the business. Uh, we have the Rock and R there in Bozeman, proud Bobcat bar. Although I became a, a Grizzly fan when Mick Delaney was your head coach. He's a personal friend, so I can... Uh, Never been able to stomach it, but when Mick became the coach, I rooted for him until he got the Bozeman. And he was a class act. <laughs> I don't think so. I did have to wear a maroon sweatshirt this year, so that was a hard pill to swallow. But uh, my experience in the Bozeman, so we had the Rock and R mixers, and we had Ferraro's Fine Italian Restaurant. So we had a real nice cross section. They're all independent operations. The, the toughest problem we had, and we have sold our restaurant, we sold it in September. We had 22 new established opens in the last 18 months. All of our employee base came from Montana State University, whether it was managers or waiters or dishwashers or cooks. What drove me out of the restaurant business was the lack of the quality in the kitchen and the ability to, to develop management. As a small opera, operator, I don't have the ability to really sit down and give those kids the skills they need. I'll develop them with them, but if they came with me with a greater skill set, not only would they be more successful, I would be more successful as an industry. I also want to address, some people talk about the incomes that these kids can make. We have a lot of low earners in the industry, but if you're willing to work hard, you can make a good life for yourself. Um, I'm going to give you two examples. The person that runs the Rock and R and Mixers is a finance major at Montana State University. He became and he runs our operations, and people go, why did you become a, you know, you went to school to be a finance guy and do all this, blah, blah, blah. Well, what I want to tell you is we afforded him an opportunity. By the time he was 30, he had every one of his student loans paid off. He had no financial assistance from his family. He was from Whitefish, Montana. Uh, he also bought a four-bedroom home in Bozeman, Montana, and he paid his car loan off all the time he was 30. He started managing for us at 25. So I'd say we were an industry, and I'm proud of the fact that we provided this young man the opportunity. Our goal with him is he's my retirement program. <laughs> As you get older, these young people back here don't want to talk to Mike anymore. They want to talk to somebody they can relate to. Uh, we also at the restaurant, the uh, young lady that ran, the front side of our house started as a waitress for us, actually started as a, a busser. She went through, got her education degree, went out, decided she did not like teaching school, came to me and said, Mike, I'd love to get into management for you. And the one thing an education degree does, it gives you the ability to manage and organize things. And she became a manager for, for us. And I'm proud to say that her and her husband on her salary bought a house in Bozeman, Montana. If you're not familiar with Bozeman, it's a tough place to affordability-wise. So there's just two operations, and both of those young individuals were under 30 and did that. And our industry supplied that. So I would encourage you to support. And the final piece I'd like to tell you, when Dr. Zato showed up to Bozeman, I called up and demanded a meeting with the new president. <laughs> she didn't know who I was, had no clue, but we sat in her office. I said, Dr. Cruzado, I've been around this community since 1981. I've talked to three or two presidents past prior to you about a hospitality program. We as an industry needed a hospitality program. So Dr. Cruzado, I would like to thank you for listening. Uh, our industry needs this. We can support it. 
We will financially support it. And you'll find out that when these kids come out of this program, these young adults, they will want to get back to your university system as a whole. Because that's the most important thing we can do as a university system. We want these people to stay in our state. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Additional public comment. Additional public comment. Additional public comment. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> the 11:30 concern was solved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, once again, uh, final comments from me. I just once again would like to thank you, M. Western, for rolling out the red carpet the last couple of days. You've been a wonderful host. Thank you, Chancellor, and please thank your folks uh, for us as well. And as we always do, I'd like to thank Montana PBS um, for what they do uh, all the time, uh, but certainly during our Board of Regent meetings. Um, thank you very much, Montana PBS. Um, I would remind the Board of Regents that we will immediately uh, go into executive session in the boardroom uh, in this, right here. this building, which is right next door. No, not building, room. Room, I'm sorry. Uh, the room right next room door. Right next door. The boardroom in, <laughs> in this building. <laughs> Was that clear to everybody? <laughs> yeah. uh, to discuss litigation strategy update. Um, and unless there are no further comments or announcements, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.